Hello and welcome to the GUMS P4P DKHI review lecture. My name is Michael. Uh, this lecture has been designed based on the PBL cases during P4P, so it may not cover everything you need to know, uh, but I've done a, you know, as best as I can to keep it nice and broad whilst also making it nice and high yield. Uh, I advise you to look at some other resources in addition to this lecture. So um, there's a document going around called Multi-Choice Questions Explained. I'll post a link to this so that you can have it. It's basically an explanation for all the old P4P formative exam questions. Uh, focus on learning the big picture as always. Try and put everything together in terms of, you know, how does the thyroid talk to the uterus and so on. Try and make those connections in a simple and easy to remember way and then focus on the detail later. Um, look at the old review lectures and of course use all the resources that I'm sure you've been using throughout the two years. <clears throat> the content of this lecture is endocrine, renal, HIV, MS, breast cancer, CF and burns. Then <clears throat> talking a little bit about aging, acute abdomen, fertility and obstetrics and gynecology. The obstetrics and gynecology section is uh, a little bit more detail than is required, but it gives you a little bit of an introduction for third year when you do it in your rotation. So I just wanted to kind of flesh it out a little bit so that you're a bit more prepared for next year. And as always, good luck. So let's firstly talk about the thyroid. I think the best place to start with the thyroid is you know, a common presenting complaint that you wouldn't at first consider to be a thyroid condition, and that's a lump in the neck. This is something that people would go to their GP with quite commonly, and they're probably very worried that it's cancer. Because if you Google lump in the neck, that's what you'll find is lymphoma. Uh, but here's sort of a systematic approach. So firstly, probably one of the most common causes of, you know, swollen lumps is a reactive lymph node where there's a nearby infection and the lymph node has swollen up in response to that. The features of that are typically that the lymph node will be tender and swollen, so when you palpate it, it's sore. Contrast that to a cancerous lymph node, such as in lymphoma, where it's swollen, but it's rock hard and non-tender. Okay, that these aren't absolutely true, and of course a cancerous lymph node would have associated inflammation, but that's sort of the general rule, is that if a lump is hard and doesn't hurt, that's suspicious for cancer. If it hurts, there's a good chance it's just an inflammatory process secondary to infection. Other causes on the page, you know, are quite rare. But I want to draw your attention to the autoimmune conditions uh, to do with the thyroid because a swollen thyroid could be considered a lump in the neck by some people. And another one that I haven't put on this list is a thyroid nodule. If a thyroid nodule is in sort of the superior portion of the thyroid lobes, even if the thyroid is normal sized, that little lump might be just detectable by the patient because it's going to be right in front of their throat. Congenital things to consider, and these are quite important for the exam. Obviously not all of these, uh, but the one that really matters is the thyroglossal duct cyst. If a thyroglossal duct cyst exists, it'll be connected to the foramen sacum at the base of the tongue. So tongue protrusion will cause elevation of a thyroglossal duct cyst. If someone has a mass on their thyroid gland or a goiter of the thyroid, the suspensory berries ligaments, which attach the thyroid to the trachea, will cause elevation of the thyroid on swallowing because the larynx elevates during swallowing. So if you examine someone and there's a lump on the anterior midline of the neck, it could either be a thyroglossal duct cyst or something to do with the thyroid. If you feel the lump under your finger and then ask the person to poke their tongue out and it doesn't move, then it's unlikely to be a thyroglossal duct cyst. 
If you then get to them to swallow a cup of water and it moves upwards, then it's likely a thyroid pathology. And if neither of those maneuvers make the lump move, it's probably something else, like a subcutaneous cyst or some kind of lymphatic condition. Just a reminder of the surface anatomy related to the thyroid exam that uh, most people, um, obviously not us because Griffith is beautiful, uh, they go a little bit too high when examining the thyroid. Uh, so it's not in front of the thyroid cartilage, but you feel for the laryngeal prominence of the thyroid cartilage. Then you travel your finger down a bit and you'll feel an indent and it, it, it comes faster than, than you'd expect. Like on this diagram, it looks like there's almost a couple of centimeters there, but on myself, I feel the, the prominence and then I, there's an indent and then I feel another thick ring. And that's probably only half a centimeter on me. So maybe these things vary, but as you travel down, you'll feel the second ring, which is the cricoid cartilage. And then lateral to the cricoid cartilage is the superior pole of each wing of the thyroid. And if you go inferiorly to each of those, those are the lobes of the thyroid. And there's the narrow isthmus, which connects each lobe. And maybe you'll be able to palpate that. In myself, I can just barely palpate the uh, superior poles of the thyroid lobes. But in my friend, I can palpate probably the top half of it. It really depends on, you know, how close to the surface it is and how superior or inferiorly it sits in front of the larynx. And it's different in men, men and women as well. But just remind yourself for OSCEs, the thyroid is lower than you'd expect. Here's a little overview of examination. Uh, I won't go through this, but in essence, make sure you revise the peripheral features of thyroid disease. So looking at their, you know, from a systematic point of view, a head to toe examination would be appropriate where you uh, have a look at their eyes. So exophthalmos engraves, consider their heart. So how is their circulation? What's their heart rate? Is their heart rate regular? Keep traveling down the body, have a look at the skin, have a look at the hair for hair loss, have a look at the shins for swelling. Check the reflexes for hyper or hyporeflexia. Consider proximal myopathy, especially in the deltoids. And keep it simple. Uh, you know, if someone's tired, cold, uh, they're having trouble losing weight or they've gained a lot of weight, um, they've got dry skin and their eyebrows are falling off, it's hypo. And if their heart rate is slow, that's very helpful. If they're, you know, hot all the time, very skinny, lots of energy, feeling a little bit strange in the head, feeling their heart racing in their chest and their peripheries are all warm and really well perfused uh, because thyroid causes peripheral vasodilation. Uh, it's likely hyperthyroid. Then have a look at the thyroid itself. As we said, find the laryngeal prominence, travel down to the cricoid, then palpate the thyroid. If there's any lumps, get them to swallow, get them to poke their tongue out, and then check the lymph nodes. It's basically the same lymph node examination you learned in your respiratory exam, you know, all the um, cervical, submandibular, the neck lymph nodes, plus the subcarinal lymph node, um, as much as you can palpate it, and the axillary nodes. That's to check if there's a thyroid cancer that has metastasized to a nearby nodal structure. Percuss the sternum, uh, but that's kind of rarely done. And then auscultate the thyroid, because if a thyroid is chronically stimulated by TSH, there'll be increased vascularity, and uh, those extra vessels will have turbulent blood flow, and you'll be able to hear that as a brewery over the thyroid. Again, sort of a rare thing. The reality is that the blood tests tell you everything in this uh, case, but that's not really how we're meant to do medicine. Here's an example of hypothyroidism. And you don't need to know all of this, but just get a good picture in your mind of, you know, tired, weight gain, cold, 
issues with the mind, issues with the skin and hair, a slow heart rate, slow reflexes, everything is slow and cold. Then just think of the opposite of that basically for hyperthyroid, you know, heat intolerance, weight loss, uh, a very fast heart rate, fast reflexes, very well and warm perfused peripheries. And then some of the things that are specific to Graves, such as exophthalmos, which leads to a lid lag and the thyroid stare, which is what's uh, imaged here in this slide. Uh, and then the uh, pretibial myxedema, which again, there's a version of that in hypothyroidism, but there's another sort of inflammatory version of that in Graves' disease to do with uh, the release of certain chemicals in response to an inflammatory reaction with fibroblasts in the dermis in front of the shins. It's, it's a swelling of the um, pretibial area, but additionally, there'll be a scaly red inflamed appearance. Thoracic outlet syndrome is worth talking about because it's loved in anatomy by Dissa. So, Firstly, to sort of structure this, let's think about the thoracic outlet. There are three things that can be squished that matter, the vein, the artery, and the nerve. If you block a vein, you prevent blood from being drained from the arm back to the heart, so you might get edema of the arm. And if you block the artery, you get ischemia to the arm, which includes all the nerves in the arm. So you'll lose your pulse, your skin will be pale, It'll be painful from ischemia, but you'll also have paresthesia from impaired nerve function. It kind of looks a lot like compartment syndrome, uh, which is the multiple P's of pulseless pain, pallor, paresthesia, and something else. And then the brachial plexus injuries, which depending on where the lesion is, can be different nerve roots. But one that I'm sure you know well is Horner's syndrome with T1 nerve root, because sympathetic fibers to the cranium come out from the T1 nerve root, travel superior, superiorly through the cervical ganglion, and then branch out into the eyes and the face. And so loss of that sympathetic innervation to the face leads to meiosis, which is a constricting of the pupil because the sympathetic nerves normally dilate the pupil. Partial ptosis, because sympathetic innervation of Mueller's muscle, which controls keeping the eyelids fully open at rest. Uh, it's an autonomically controlled muscle. And hemifacial anhydrosis, when you lose sympathetic nerves. Some of the causes, um, obviously Pankos tumor, you would have talked about for Horner's syndrome, but worth talking about an endocrine is a retrosternal goiter. If a goiter gets large enough, it can cause thoracic outlet obstruction. If the superior vena cava is obstructed, as it could be in a retrosternal goiter, you'll be uh, positive with Pemberton's sign, which the person has to hold their arms above their head for, I think it's one minute, and their face will get flushed because there's poor drainage of blood and their veins get engorged in the head. Here's an overview of control of the thyroid axis. So, as I'm sure you know, the hypothalamus releases TRH. That makes the pituitary release TSH, which makes the thyroid release thyroid hormone. It releases T4, which gets peripherally converted to T3. A little bit of T3 is also converted within the thyroid itself. Something to note is that T4 is also converted to reverse T3, which is an inactive form that you store. And if you have any problems with converting T4 to T3, you might have an elevation in reverse T3. Uh, you know, see how there's this D2 enzyme involved? If there was an issue there, you would end up shunting all this T4 down the reverse T3 pathway. That's irrelevant though, that's just some endocrine low yield fact. The thing to remember here is that thyroid hormone, whether it's T4 or T3, will have some kind of negative feedback uh, 
on the pituitary and the hypothalamus. Don't get too bogged down on, you know, where does T3 do it? Where does T4 do it? Strictly speaking, this diagram says just T4 does it, but for the purposes of our exams, just, just think of it as thyroid hormone. If thyroid hormone is high, TSH release will be blocked. That's enough. <clears throat> Here's an overview of how thyroid hormone is made. It's good just to have a rough idea. Um, you know, that thyroglobulin is a protein that gets made in the thyroid cells, the follicular cells, and then iodide is sucked up through a sodium iodide symporter, which is under the influence of TSH. Iodide gets combined um, with the thyroglobulin with the help of thyroid peroxidase, TPO, an important enzyme for a couple of reasons, to ultimately form T4 in the colloid. And then T4 is released under the influence of TSH with a little bit of it cleaved to T3. TPO is important to remember because one, if you block TPO, you can prevent the creation of thyroid hormone. And that's how propylthiouracil, or PTU, or carbimazole work. And it's also the target of autoantibodies in Hashimoto's. <clears throat> the effect of thyroid hormone on tissues, you can basically guess this, you know, it makes the heart go faster, it makes the lungs work bigger, it makes your muscles twitch more, it increases your metabolism, it makes you grow, it makes the brain grow and hypothyroid is very bad for the developing brain, and it controls thermogenesis, and so hypo are cold and hyper are hot. Something really important for our exams is the connection between thyroid and menstruation. Hypothyroidism, when you've got low levels of thyroid, result in what are called anovulatory cycles, cycles without ovulation. One mechanism of this is that when you've got elevations of TRH, which would be elevated because you're no longer having negative feedback from T4 and T3, the TRH elevation stimulates the release of prolactin. Okay, so having low levels of thyroid cause high levels of TRH, which in turn cause high levels of prolactin. High levels of prolactin inhibit the release of LH and FSH. This prevents normal menstruation because we, we need the rise in FSH in the follicular phase and we need the LH surge for ovulation. If you don't ovulate, you never form a corpus luteum and so you never get progesterone. If you don't have progesterone and all you have is estrogen, the endometrium is chronically stimulated by estrogen, it's always in the proliferative phase. And by chance, after about 40 days of being in the proliferative phase, the endometrium becomes so thick that it outgrows its own blood supply and it's spontaneously shed in a heavy period. So this is why someone with an irregular period might have a very heavy period that's quite spaced apart. It's because they're not actually ovulating, and so it's not, you know, a traditional period. This is also the same in PCOS and congenital adrenal hyperplasia, where increased levels of androgens lead to anovulation, heavy irregular periods. <clears throat> Hyperthyroid also can lead to menstrual irregularities. So high levels of thyroid can cause amenorrhea and irregular periods. And it's probably something to do with this protein called sex hormone binding globulin. When you have high thyroid, you increase the synthesis of this protein. And then this protein binds up all of your sex hormones, which means they're no longer active because they're bound to the protein. So that disrupts your levels of hormones, which in turn disrupts your release of FSH and LH and the function of the menstrual cycle. Without that, again, you might have anovulatory cycles or you might totally have amenorrhea. Basically, just understand that 
any thyroid abnormality can cause any menstrual abnormality, whether it's amenorrhea or heavy menstrual bleeding. The thyroid conditions I would like to talk about today are hypothyroid, hyperthyroid, and thyroid cancer, along with thyroid nodules. Hypothyroid, the most common cause in the West, is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It's an autoimmune condition where autoantibodies are generated against thyroid peroxidase, TPO, the enzyme we talked about earlier, and also thyroglobulin. There's an autoimmune destruction of the thyroid gland, and in the early stage, because you're breaking down the thyroid, you'll leak out thyroid hormone into the circulation, and you'll initially have what's called hashitoxicosis, uh, high levels of thyroid, which is thyrotoxicosis, but in the context of early Hashimoto's, hashitoxicosis. In the late stage, the thyroid will be fibrosed and have uh, adipose tissue replacing the functional tissue, and you'll have hypothyroidism. In terms of biochemistry, there'll be low levels of thyroid hormone, because the thyroid can't release them anymore. And because of that, there's no more negative feedback on the hypothalamus and pituitary, so there'll be high levels of TSH. Additionally, there'll be the presence of autoantibodies. And again, here's hypothyroidism. Graves' disease is the opposite. It's a autoimmune hyperthyroidism so there are autoantibodies directed against the TSH receptor, which cause the release of thyroid hormone. The release of thyroid hormone in that case is independent of TSH release because the antibody is now acting like TSH. As the thyroid hormone levels elevate, that will cause negative feedback on TSH, and so you'll have high thyroid hormone and low TSH. As we talked about earlier, there's also an immune component to this disease, which is what leads to the exophthalmos and the pretibial myxedema, which is inflammatory in nature. Here's a histology slide for Graves. Note that there's this thing called scalloping of the colloid and whatever other features DISA wants you to know. Toxic multinodular goiter is interesting. It's probably my favorite thyroid thing because it's cool, uh, but it's obviously not fun to have. When you are chronically deficient in iodine, that results in a decreased ability to make thyroid hormone. As the thyroid hormone levels drop, TSH becomes chronically elevated. But in the context of iodine deficiency, it's very difficult to bring the thyroid hormone levels up high enough in order to correct that. So you've got chronically elevated TSH. That TSH stimulates the growth and vascularization of the thyroid, leading to a goiter. Initially, because you don't have enough iodide, that causes hypothyroidism with a goiter, which is how you traditionally know of a goiter. But later on, this chronic TSH stimulation results in an increased proliferation of follicular cells, and eventually, because they're undergoing cell division, they will mutate, and the mutations that get accumulated allow for the autonomous release of thyroid hormone. It makes the follicular cells able to trigger the release of thyroid without the need for any TSH. So these little lumps are called autonomous hot nodules. Autonomous because they act without TSH and hot because they're releasing thyroid hormone. Hot nodules produce thyroid hormone and that's how you get hyperthyroidism with a toxic, toxic meaning thyroid, multinodular because each one of these little lumps is a nodule, goiter because you had a goiter. So you can have a goiter and have high thyroid hormone, not just low thyroid hormone. And equally, iodine deficiency can cause hypothyroidism, but it also leads to hyperthyroidism if you develop a toxic multinodular goiter.
Thyroid function tests in general, firstly look at the thyroid hormone, is it high or low, and then look at the TSH. If the thyroid uh, stimulating hormone, TSH, is high and the thyroid hormone is high, that means TSH is inappropriately being released because high thyroid should inhibit TSH. So that tells you that something weird is going on with the pituitary or hypothalamus that it's releasing TSH when it shouldn't. If the TSH is high and the thyroid levels are low, then it means that despite having TSH, the thyroid is struggling to produce thyroid hormone. So that tells you something's going on with the thyroid itself. And here's that diagram again, just to walk through that, that if you had high TSH, it stimulates the thyroid. If you then had low thyroid levels, that would tell you the problem is in the thyroid. If you had high TSH and high thyroid hormone, which should negatively feed back on the pituitary and hypothalamus, if the TSH remained elevated, then it tells you that the pituitary or the hypothalamus are no longer listening to the peripheral levels of thyroid hormone. Uh, thyroid antibodies are good to think about. So there's three of them. There's the TSH receptor ones, typically associated with Graves, and then there's the TPO and thyroglobulin antibodies. TPO is the most common one in Hashimoto's, and second most common would be antithyroglobulin. But have a look at Graves' disease. All three antibodies can be positive in Graves. Hashimoto's, very rarely, but you know, 10% is 1 in 10, will also have TSH receptor antibodies. So these antibodies aren't really a perfect test. And this is exemplified by the fact that in the general population, 5% of people can also have um, anti-TPO and anti-TG antibodies. Thyroid scintigraphy is a method of assessing the activity of the thyroid gland. Compare that to ultrasound, which is a way of assessing the morphology of the thyroid and looking for nodules and cancer. Scintigraphy tells you you know, that thyroid tissue, is it hyperactive or hypoactive? Early on, this was done using radioactive iodine, but these days they use technetium. So it's also called a technetium scan. You give IV technetium and then 20 minutes later, because technetium is preferentially taken up by active areas of the thyroid, those areas will glow on a uh, for a scintillation camera because they release gamma radiation. They place a little marker on the sternal notch to make sure that you are well orientated when you look at the scan. You want to, you know, you can imagine if someone didn't have a thyroid or if their thyroid was very underactive in Hashimoto's, you might actually not see the thyroid gland, right? Because it's not going to be glowing anywhere. So that little notch ensures that you're oriented anatomically so you know what you're looking at. Normally there should be a diffuse normal level of uptake. In Graves' disease there's a diffuse symmetrical increased uptake because it's an immune process and the entire thyroid gland is being stimulated by the antibodies. In a toxic multinodular goiter there's a sort of heterotropic nodular increased uptake that re represents each of those little hot nodules with the rest of the thyroid being relatively underactive because the excess thyroid hormones coming from those nodules reduces levels of TSH. So the normal levels, uh, the, the normal thyroid tissue becomes a little bit underactive because it's not autonomous while the nodules are. A toxic adenoma, you've got a single hot nodule and then thyroiditis, you've got a very underactive, global, globally dim diminished thyroid activity. When someone has a thyroid nodule, either found on examination or CT scan as an incidental finding, or if you've somehow decided, you know, from issues with swallowing or whatever, um, to do an ultrasound, you can then test their TSH level. If the TSH is high or normal, 
it means that that nodule isn't an autonomous hot nodule, because if it was, it would be pumping out thyroid hormone and that would cause TSH to drop. If you've got low TSH, it means that that nodule is hot and it's causing negative feedback to reduce TSH. Hot nodules have a very low chance of being cancer. So if you find a nodule and someone has a low level of TSH, that's very reassuring. At the same time, that means they probably need to see an endocrinologist because they have hyperthyroidism, but from a cancer point of view, it's very reassuring. If their TSH is high and the nodule is cold, that has quite a high chance of being cancer. Then you will biopsy this nodule. Typically, all cold nodules need to be biopsied, but hot nodules don't necessarily need to be biopsied depending on their size and whatever other guidelines. The biopsy will tell you what to do next. You might need to do a hemithyroidectomy or a complete thyroidectomy. There are guidelines to guide this sort of thing, and here's the GP guidelines for investigation. Thyroid cancer very quickly, I just wanted to remind you that there's a couple of different types. Most of them come from the follicular cells. So papillary and follicular are both from the follicular cells. And then anaplastic is a poorly differentiated version of uh, the follicular cancer. And parafollicular or C cells, they, uh, they become medullary carcinoma. It's important to note that they're sort of like endocrine cells that produce calcitonin, and so they are the ones that turn into cancer in the genetic condition, multiple endocrine neoplasia. It's kind of easy to remember that because they're an endocrine cell that's a little bit unique inside the thyroid. I recognize the whole thyroid is endocrine, so maybe that's not a good way to remember it, but you can kind of at least put a little bit of uniqueness on the parafollicular cells and medullary carcinoma. It also begins with M, and MEN is the acronym for the syndrome, and all the other thyroid cancers don't begin with M. So it's got an M in it, the syndrome is MEN, and the cells are endocrine cells that produce a unique hormone within the thyroid. Maybe that helps, I don't know. MEN um, is worth knowing about, to be honest, like it might not be on your exams, but in clinical years it, it comes, up, comes up quite a bit because, you know, there are endocrine surgeons during general surgery, and also sometimes the decks that they use to create the DKHI exams, they'll just throw this stuff at you, so you may as well just have a brief idea of it now. And MEN2 has two subtypes, 2A and 2B. So there's sort of three different diseases. The best way to remember these is just to keep it really simple. And I like these acronyms from AMBOSS is that MEN1 has three Ps, parathyroid, pancreas, and pituitary. Whereas both MEN2 and MEN-A are associated with medullary thyroid carcinoma. They both are associated with pheochromocytoma. But the difference between 2A and 2B is that 2A also has parathyroid issues. How you remember this, I don't know how you're going to. At your level, the questions are quite simple. It'll be someone that has, you know, cancer of the parathyroid and then the pancreas. And the multi-choice answers will be just random things. And then one of them will be multiple endocrine neoplasia. At a later level, you probably would have to sort of have a rough idea of, you know, the multi-choice answers might be men one, men two. I don't know how you remember this stuff, to be honest. I guess it's just flashcards at the end of the day. But from a principal point of view, I want you to keep in mind that there exists this syndrome where people get tumors in lots of different endocrine tissues, and it all relates to one common syndrome. So pa parathyroid, pancreas, and pituitary for men one. If you could at least remember that, 
then that kind of gives you one third of the questions that you're guaranteed to know. MEN2, if you can remember that medullary thyroid cancer, I'm sure there's some sort of smart way to make that stick. For me personally, um, as we were talking about before, the medullary thyroid cancer, it begins with M, which is how I remember that it's to do with men, and it comes from parafollicular cells, which this is going to be kind of silly, but they are the second type of cell that I care about in the thyroid. The first cell is the, you know, follicular cells, but the second type is the parafollicular cell. And this is the second type of men. It's a cancer of the parafollicular cells, medullary thyroid cancer. That's how I kind of piece things together. Um, don't worry about this stuff, to be honest. It's kind of low yield. In terms of thyroid pharmacology, the things you should know are to treat hyperthyroidism, one of the options is to use radioiodine to destroy the thyroid. And then once the thyroid is gone, you can su supplement uh, with thyroxine tablets to ensure that they're getting a normal amount of thyroid hormone. That's kind of the preferred option if there are any potential issues that are going to happen with medical therapy, because it's, you know, it's, it's very safe. The medical therapies are carbimazole and propylthiouracil. These both block the thyroid peroxidase TPO enzyme, so they prevent the production of thyroid hormone. But PTU has the added benefit of inhibiting the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. Both drugs can cause issues with pancytopenia, and if that happens, it's then contraindicated for life, and you have to have the radioactive iodine treatment. Uh, another thing to be aware of is beta blocker therapy. It has to be a non-selective beta blocker because it's beta-2 receptors that regulate the T4 to T3 um, transition, and propanolol is a drug that can inhibit that. Uh, T4 can be given to people, and T4 has a really long half-life of about a week. T3 only lasts for a couple of days, 24 to 48 hours. So when you're giving these medications, it takes quite a long time for them to build up a normal level and have a normal effect. So treatment of hypothyroidism with T4 it can take like three weeks before things get back to normal. Um, T3 can be given sometimes, and there are very shady, like alternative health, GP, endocrinology, natural type things that they believe by giving you T3, it resembles what's your natural hormone status. Um, it's all a rip-off, and the official recommendation is that T4 alone is sufficient. Adrenals. So there's the adrenal cortex and then the adrenal medulla. And the adrenal cortex has three layers, glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. And you can remember what they do, um, and you can remember their names by GFR. You know, the way we measure kidney function, GFR, GFR and salt, sugar, sex. If you can at least remember that um, aldosterone <clears throat> is, is released by the glomerulosa, um, which is kind of easy to remember because it sounds like glomerulus. So it's got something that reminds you of the kidney and the kidney reminds you of aldosterone. You can figure out that the first one is aldosterone. And then out of the other two, it's a 50-50 guess, but I think if you just write this down enough times, you'll eventually remember that fasciculata is cortisol and reticularis is androgens.
The other half is the adrenal medulla, <clears throat> which has chromaffin cells, which release catecholamines, adrenaline, noradrenaline. I don't talk about it here, but I just wanted to discuss two syndromes that you should know. Uh, Kohn's syndrome, which is primary hyperaldosteronism, that's when you have a tumour of the adrenal cortex which produces aldosterone and you get very high levels of aldosterone. You get secondary hypertension and you get all the electrolyte effects of having high aldosterone, which are having low potassium in the blood because you're peeing it out. And also alkalosis, which we've talked about during ISM, <clears throat> um, because aldosterone causes alkalosis by causing you to pee out more hydrogen ions. So when someone has hypertension, before deciding that it's just, you know, primary hypertension, if you have a look at the electrolytes and they're a bit weird, you should consider that, you know, if this is a young person, maybe something else is going on and this isn't just your stock standard hypertension. This is secondary to another disease. The adrenal medulla can have tumours, and those tumours are called pheochromocytomas. Pheochromocytomas produce catecholamines, and typically they do it in surges. So you'll have this rapid elevation of blood pressure associated with panic and tachycardia, and then you'll be okay. And it'll just go up and down episodically. Uh, that's not always the case, but it's, it, it is um, an example. And the way you test for that is um, you test in the blood for what are called metanephrines. They're sort of the metabolites that show you the activity of a pheochromocytoma. Uh, the, the other thing I'd like to add here is that pheochromocytoma is one of the tumours of the multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome. Another weird way of remembering things uh, for trying to remember what tumours are to do with which multiple endocrine neoplasia is that both multiple endocrine neoplasia 2A and 2B, they both have the medullary thyroid carcinoma. That's the main disease that differentiates type 1 from type 2. And they both have pheochromocytoma. And then the difference between them is that 2A also has parathyroid issues and 2B has multiple neuromas. So the way you can kind of remember that, you know, type 1 and type 2 are different in terms of this, you know, pheochromocytoma thing is that it's the adrenal medulla where pheochromocytomas come from. And the difference between type 1 and type 2 is that type 2 has medullary thyroid cancer. It's got the word medulla in it. So I don't know if that's how you remember things, but you know, the difference between type one and type two is that there's medullary thyroid cancer. It's got the word medulla in it, which makes me think of the adrenal medulla, which is where pheochromocytomas come from. And both types of men too have pheochromocytomas. As we said before, one way to try and remember that MEN2 has medullary thyroid cancer is that the medullary thyroid cancer comes from parafollicular cells, which are the second main type of cell in the thyroid for the second kind of multiple endocrine neoplasia. This might be the craziest way to remember stuff, but it's, it's how my brain works. Like, if I can come up with these little rules based on language, I can use that rule 10 years from now and, you know, it, it helps. A brief reminder about aldosterone. So it comes from the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal cortex. It binds to mineralocorticoid receptors, uh, which promote sodium reabsorption, potassium and hydrogen secretion, resulting in an increase in plasma volume with a decrease in levels of potassium and a rebalancing of acid base towards the alkalotic side. And its release is stimulated when angiotensin II is released in the RAS system. It's independent from ACTH release. 
So it's not really affected by things like Cushing's disease or secondary Addison's disease. It is affected in primary Addison's because that's a pathology of the whole adrenal gland, uh, or at least the cortex. But secondary Addison's, which is to do with having a deficiency of ACTH, that won't cause issues with aldosterone because aldosterone doesn't need ACTH to be released. The other thing that I should really add to this slide is Conn syndrome, primary hyperaldosteronism, secondary hypertension that's refractory to normal antihypertensive treatment associated with hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis. Cortisol. The functions of cortisol are, you know, it's worth knowing, but you can learn this stuff slowly, you know, like if you look at what Cushing's syndrome looks like, you'll eventually remember what cortisol does. So the goal of cortisol is basically to increase blood sugar any way you can. And the way it does that is it makes you produce more glucose, makes you uh, break down your proteins and lipids so you end up with muscle wasting. It makes you hungry and it actually decreases the function of your insulin to prevent you know, the uptake of sugar into your muscles because all it wants to do is increase blood sugar in order to give it to your brain. The whole purpose of cortisol is that it's a stress hormone in order to maintain baseline functioning, just to get sugar into the brain so that you can not go into a coma, you know? But that's bad when you have lots of cortisol. Uh, cortisol directly interferes with bone metabolism. So we know people on high dose steroids for a long time are at risk of osteoporosis. It inhibits the immune system through lots of different effects involving lymphocytes, monocytes, and neutrophils. It also delays wound healing. And because you break down the protein in the skin, that's why you get striations because the structural strength of the skin breaks down. So the other thing that I'm not sure, it's not on this slide, is that cortisol has effects on the brain. So we know that in the long term, high levels of cortisol cause depression. That's the whole thing with the disrupted hypothalamic pituitary axis. And, you know, the reason why you wake up really early in the morning with depression and that your, you know, appetite and weight gain all changes, those things are likely secondary to changes in cortisol. But also in the short term, cortisol gives you insomnia and can make you look a little bit manic. So it makes you quite active and kind of psychotic. So those are sort of opposite ends of the spectrum, but basically any mood disturbance, memory issue, and sleeping issue can be attributed to steroid use, especially dexamethasone. The other thing that's worth noting is that cortisol and other steroids, they potentiate the activity of adrenoreceptors and so high levels of cortisol can cause hypertension. When they're very high, they also interact with mineralocorticoid receptors and begin to act like aldosterone. So they can cause fluid retention and hypokalemia from potassium excretion because the steroids at a high dose begin to act like aldosterone. The other thing to sort of consider there then is that if you had low cortisol, you could have really low blood pressure because your adrenoreceptors aren't working how they normally do. So you can't make the heart beat faster and harder and you lose your ability to vasoconstrict like normal. And the other thing that, you know, I'll just say it now and maybe it will stick in your mind in the future is that fludrocortisone, which is a corticosteroid, has really potent activity against mineralocorticoid receptors, and it can be used when someone has low aldosterone, either because of primary Addison's or in someone with chronic postural hypotension. It'll, you know, promote water retention and hopefully reduce their symptoms of postural hypotension. So that drug is fludrocortisone. 
here is a sort of clinical picture of Cushing. So the moon face, buffalo hump, striations, poor wound healing, central obesity, proximal myopathy, poor sleeping, poor memory, poor mood, uh, chronic infections, especially fungal infections, osteoporosis, and eventually diabetes because you've got this chronic hyperglycemia secondary to gluconeogenesis, fat breakdown, protein breakdown. When you burn fat, you can't actually turn it back into sugar. But if you burn fat, it means that you're not burning sugar. And if you're not burning sugar, you then have high levels of sugar. So that's obviously not something that matters that much. But if you've, you know, anyone with a biochemistry background, it's a big no-no to sort of say, oh yeah, fat turns into sugar. What really happens is that by burning fat, you're getting ATP from the fat, so therefore you don't have to burn the sugar, and so the sugar gets high. Anyway, that's Cushing's. The different forms of Cushing's are um, elucidated by the dexamethasone suppression test. So in a normal person, they will have normal levels of ACTH at rest, and when you give them a low dose of dexamethasone, their cortisol will go down because their pituitary is listening to that cortisol. And when you add the dex, the pituitary says, oh, wow, we've got a lot of cortisol, negative feedback time, reduce the ACTH. And the same thing will happen with a high dose dexamethasone suppression test. So that's a normal person. High levels of steroids inhibit the release of ACTH. In primary hypercortisolism, that's where there's a tumor of the adrenal cortex and um, it's producing cortisol independently of ACTH, kind of like a hot thyroid nodule produces thyroid hormone independently of TSH. The primary hypercortisolism, it will release cortisol independently of ACTH. So when you give dexamethasone, you will drop the levels of ACTH, but that doesn't actually change the levels of circulating cortisol because you could have zero ACTH and that tumor would still produce cortisol. Cushing's disease is a tumor of the pituitary gland which produces ACTH. So at rest, you have high levels of ACTH. Cushing's disease and ectopic ACTH secretion are two conditions where the low-dose and high-dose dexamethasone tests were designed to differentiate them. Ectopic ACTH typically comes from something like a small cell lung cancer, for example. When you give low-dose dexamethasone in both of those diseases, because the pituitary is producing ACTH and it's a tumor, it doesn't really listen to cortisol the way it normally does. So when you get the low dose, nothing happens. And that will happen whether it's the pituitary or an ectopic secretion. But the thing to think about is that the pituitary, when given a really high dose of dexamethasone, even though it is a pituitary tumor, because it still has some behavior of a pituitary, the high-dose dexamethasone will inhibit the release of ACTH and the levels of cortisol will drop. If it's ectopic ACTH secretion from a lung cancer, that lung cell has never ever known what it's like to have negative feedback. So no matter how much, uh, how much dexamethasone you give, it'll never undergo negative feedback and again, the levels of cortisol will remain unchanged. That's the main way that you can differentiate these things. You can also do petrosal sinus sampling, which is where you put little angiocatheters into the petrosal sinus, uh, the venous sinus, and you sample the blood coming directly out of the pituitary and you can see if there's a high concentration of ACTH at the pituitary or not. So firstly, we need to decide whether the cortisol is coming from high ACTH or from a primary tumor of the adrenal cortex. 
we then need to figure out if it's high ACTH, is that ACTH coming from the pituitary or from another tissue like a small, uh, small cell lung cancer? And that's what the dexamethasone suppression test does. After having a read of up to date, I will also add that while this is a cool piece of physiology, it turns out that in practice, they're no longer using this test because in Cushing's disease, where it's the pituitary tumor, there are certain kinds of tumors that are quite common that they don't have negative feedback from the high dose dexamethasone. Equally, there are now findings of ectopic tumors that do get negative feedback. So the results can be wrong. So the follow up these days is firstly, do a CT scan of the adrenals to see if you can see an adrenal tumor. And that would tell you that it's probably the primary hypercortisolism. Then you could try to imaging of the lungs to see if there's a lung tumor. But the most definitive test will be that petrosal sinus sampling we talked about. And if you can demonstrate a gradient between petrosal sinus and peripheral venous levels of ACTH, showing that there's a very high amount of ACTH at the pituitary gland itself, that helps to confirm that it's actually Cushing's disease and not ectopic ACTH from something like small cell lung cancer. Think about Cushing's and what the person looks like, and then imagine the opposite. Someone with lots of weight loss, someone who has a very low appetite. That is a very non-specific picture. And this disease is historically known to be very, very underdiagnosed and because of that, very deadly. This is Addison's disease. In someone who's lost weight, they're tired and has some sort of general complaints of, you know, systemic complaints, the constitutional symptoms, you should suspect Addison's. And one finding that is fairly common is pigmentation of the skin, specifically uh, sort of brown pigmentation in the mouth and on the hands. Now that's not always going to be there. Uh, and the other thing that will help is because uh, of issues with blood pressure, these people will often have postural hypotension. So if someone comes in with, you know, a long history of fatigue, you do the workup for anemia, you do the workup for hypothyroid. You know, if they're old, you give them scopes. If it seems like a mental health condition, you talk about that. And it probably will end up being a mental health diagnosis in the end because people will just stop looking at one point. You need to step back and do the physical examination looking for these issues um, on the skin and then check the blood pressure and ask about other things to do with the abdomen. That's when you should look for Addison's. In the general practice textbook by Dr. Murtar, he has another textbook called Common Pitfalls in General Practice. And in one of them, he outlines a case where a young girl was fatigued, kept coming to the GP for years, had some issues with uh, syncope, you know, kept being decided that it was just dehydration at the emergency department. And then finally, after a couple of years, he had a look in her mouth and under her lips was this pigmented lesion. And he put it together and, you know, it was Addison's. And you'll see Addison's maybe once in your lifetime. So you can understand why it's missed so much, but it's just the opposite of Cushing's. So Addison's can be primary or secondary or tertiary. Primary is where there's been something wrong with the adrenal gland itself. And that's primary adrenal insufficiency where you have low levels of aldosterone, cortisol, and the adrenal androgens because the whole adrenal gland is inflamed. 
the most common cause uh, in the Western world is autoimmune, but in the rest of the world, it's tuberculosis. You can get um, tuberculosis that has spread in the body and has decided to live inside the adrenal glands. You can get bleeding into the adrenals, um, for example, after sepsis and disseminated intravascular coagulation. Uh, and you can have tumors, or you could have had surgery and had it removed, or you could have, uh, you know, some kind of genetic issue to do with the enzymes in the synthetic pathway. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia is sort of a version of this, and depending on the version of um, CAH that you have, you can end up with low levels of everything, or just low levels of cortisol and the um, androgens are okay. Um, there's a couple of different combinations. There's people that are salt wasting and there's people that are not salt wasting. Uh, but in basically every case, you'll end up with high androgens. That's why the syndrome is, is known for, you know, anovulation and symptoms of hyperandrogenism. Secondary is when it's because of low levels of ACTH coming from the pituitary. Uh, the most common cause of this is iatrogenic, when someone's been given a high dose of steroids, it causes negative feedback on the pituitary, so you no longer produce ACTH. And then when you stop giving them the steroids suddenly, the pituitary kind of, it's gone to sleep and it doesn't wake up for a while. And so endogenous cortisol production is reduced and the person goes into secondary addisons. There's also you know, all the primary pathologies of the pituitary, which are relatively more rare compared to the primary pathologies of the adrenal glands when it comes to Addison's. Uh, this is just a summary of the um, pathophysiology of each. You can have a look at this in your own time. Uh, finally, I wanted to sort of tie up cortisol by talking about the relative potency of the different steroids that you're going to see next year. So the most common steroid you'll see is prednisone, also known as prednisolone. That's kind of like the standard that's given in COPD, asthma, and other conditions. Hydrocortisone is our sort of baseline steroid, so that's got a relative potency of one. Compared to that, prednisone is four times more potent. So the same dose of prednisone as hydrocortisone has a four times greater effect. Compared to that, methylprednisolone is a little bit stronger. Prednisone and methylpred are more or less equivalent. Methylpred is just available as an IV formulation. So if you need to give intravenous steroids, um, if there's you know a COPD exacerbation that's you know really bad or they're nil by mouth, IV methylprednisone is an option. The most potent sort of oral steroid is dexamethasone. It's 25 times more potent than hydrocortisone, and compared to prednisone it's you know approximately five to six times stronger. So a standard dose of prednisone in a COPD exacerbation would be 50 milligrams, but a very high dose of dexamethasone might be, you know, eight milligrams. So just to get your head around these numbers is quite helpful because you know on oncology they use dexamethasone a lot to reduce the swelling around tumors and people have to go on um, prophylaxis to prevent secondary you know, uh, pneumonia with dexamethasone doses of like three. And you look at that as a student and you're like, three sounds like a low number, but three milligrams of dex is, you know, the same thing as 60 milligrams of hydrocortisone or 15 milligrams of prednisolone. We also then, in terms of GP land, have all the topical steroids. And you don't need to know this, but you know, again, we start with hydrocortisone, 
Then you have betamethasone, which is worth knowing about, um, and then some others. But if you could know that there's hydrocortisone and then betamethasone is more potent than that, that's a very good start. Androgens. Uh, so the function of androgens, so we've got our DHEA, dihydroepiandrosterone, or something like that. They produce uh, androstene dione, which becomes testosterone, which becomes dihydrotestosterone, which is the sort of active form. That's the sort of 5-alpha reductase thing, and there are drugs to prevent that, which are used in benign prostatic hyperplasia. Uh, the, the effects of androgens are essentially to promote hair growth, which is one of the things you look for in women if they have, you know, facial hair or moustache or chest hair, to cause acne and to cause secondary sexual characteristics in men. Um, and in young women, if they have high levels of androgens, it can make the external genitalia become pigmented and uh, have a different morphology than, you know, what would be typically expected in terms of the development of the genitals. This is the pathway going from cholesterol to the sex hormones. And I bring this up to talk about congenital adrenal hyperplasia. I will admit, I didn't understand this in second year. I thought it was when you're born with big adrenal glands and they produce lots of androgens, right? Because it's congenital, it's the adrenals, and there's hyperplasia. The name sucks. What it actually is, is a defect in one of the enzymes involved in the steroid biosynthesis pathway. 21 beta hydroxylase is the most common, but I think there's also 11 and a couple of others, but the one I know is 21, and that's the one I've seen in exam questions. 21 beta hydroxylase is responsible for the conversion, or at least it's a step in the conversion, of going from progesterone to aldosterone and cortisol. The production of androgens so the androstene dione and DHEA, that is intact. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at this like a flow chart, cholesterol gets processed and would normally be turned into aldosterone within the zona glomerulosa or cortisol within the zona fasciculata. But because neither of those happen, it all gets shunted towards the only functioning enzyme, which will produce androgens. So the adrenal glands produce lots of androgens. Because they're not producing cortisol, you'll have increased levels of ACTH, because cortisol is the most potent negative feedback on ACTH. Chronically high levels of ACTH cause hyperplasia of the adrenal glands. In the same way that high levels of TSH cause a goiter in thyroid, high levels of ACTH cause adrenal hyperplasia. Tying that all together, you get a congenital syndrome because it's during development of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that this hyperplasia will occur. It's the adrenal gland because that's where this enzyme deficiency is happening. And it's hyperplastic because Elevations of ACTH secondary to cortisol deficiency promote hyperplasia in the adrenal cortex. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Big, chunky adrenal glands, low levels of cortisol and aldosterone, high levels of androgens. Features of hyperandrogenism, including facial hair, chest hair, acne, and in women, anovulatory cycles because the androgens, just like they do in PCOS, they interfere with the menstrual cycle. So you'll have those long 40-day cycles with heavy bleeding, sometimes with um, complete amenorrhea. There's another version which um, aldosterone production is maintained. Uh, so don't worry too much about that. There's, um, there's this thing of the...
salt wasting classic type versus the um, type that doesn't have salt wasting. It's because the 21 beta hydroxylase enzyme mutations, they don't totally destroy the enzyme, they, they kind of change how it functions. And so some mutations, aldosterone production is retained and some it's not. The features are summarized here. Um, the important thing is just that this can be a cause of infertility because anovulatory cycles means there's no ovulation, there's no egg, there's no fertilization. Parathyroid. Let's quickly talk about it. What does it do? It releases parathyroid hormone, which acts on the bone to release calcium, acts on the kidney to hold on to calcium, and acts on the intestines to absorb calcium. Altogether, that increases serum levels of calcium. Parathyroid hormone and vitamin D are both helpful for calcium, but they have different goals. The goal of parathyroid hormone is to increase serum levels of calcium. It does that through the gut, the kidney, and the bone. And the difference is that it promotes the excretion of phosphate. If you held on to all that phosphate, the calcium would just bind back to phosphate and get deposited on bones again. That's not what parathyroid hormone wants. It wants free ionized calcium floating around in the blood. So when you break down the calcium phosphate salts on the bone mineral, it holds onto the calcium and pees out the phosphate in order to just have calcium left. Vitamin D similarly affects the gut, kidney, and bone to promote high levels of calcium, but it actually tells the kidney to hold on to phosphate so that you can combine the calcium and the phosphate in order to produce the mineral required to mineralize bone, because the goal of vitamin D is to increase bone density. The goal of parathyroid hormone is to increase serum calcium. This is an important difference to remember and to understand, you know, High levels of parathyroid hormone are bad for the bone, but vitamin D supplementation is generally considered good for the bone. Hyperparathyroidism is associated with high levels of calcium in the blood. It can cause issues in the heart, the kidney. Um, it, obviously, you're breaking down the bone, so it causes bone issues and constipation and psychological effects. The way to remember this is stones, bones, psychic moans, and abdominal groans, or some version of that. Um, stones is the high levels of calcium resulting in nephrocalcinosis and nephrolithiasis, kidney stones. The bones is the breakdown of your bones, increased fractures, and bone pain. The psychic moans is the depression, confusion, and hallucinations from hypercalcemia. And abdominal groans is the anorexia, nausea, vomiting, constipation, and pancreatitis associated with hypercalcemia. And another thing to mention, we talked about it, I believe, during BMB or maybe ISM, is that hypercalcemia causes chronic pain in itself. So the pain when someone has cancer, and cancers often cause lytic bone lesions, is made worse by hypercalcemia. So if you can treat the hypercalcemia, you can reduce the pain, and that's one of the treatments in palliative care. Treatment for hypercalcemia is typically IV fluid hydration with a bisphosphonate such as zolendronate given uh, intravenously uh, to prevent the bone lytic lesion breakdown. High levels of parathyroidism can come from the parathyroid itself, uh, for example, when you've got a functioning parathyroid cancer, or it can be secondary. The, the one that you should know uh, in terms of secondary and tertiary is that when someone has chronic kidney disease, their kidney is very bad at holding on to calcium. Parathyroid hormone tells the kidney to hold on to calcium, but in chronic kidney disease, it just can't do it. So parathyroid hormone will break down the bones, releasing calcium into the blood, but then you just pee it all out. 
because the kidney can't uh, reabsorb it very well. So then the calcium stays low. The parathyroid cells release the parathyroid hormone again. You get more breakdown of the bone. Calcium enters the blood, but again, the failing kidney excretes that calcium and you enter this uh, sort of positive feedback cycle where the worse the kidneys get, the worse the bones get, the higher the parathyroid hormone gets. The pathophysiology of that is, you know, directly to do with damage to the renal parenchyma, but also the inability to activate vitamin D in the kidney and the inability for those damaged kidney cells to respond to any levels of vitamin D or parathyroid hormone. Hypoparathyroidism is when you've got low levels of parathyroid and it results in hypocalcemia. And the two things you should know about hypocalcemia is Chosdek sign and Trousseau's sign. Chosdek sign is when you tap the facial nerve and the um, facial muscles uh, contract in response to that tapping. It's because the nerves become very excitable when there's low calcium. And Trousseau's sign, if you inflate the blood pressure cuff, they end up getting a carpopedal spasm. That's another sign of low calcium. The sort of thing that ties all of this together is basically that your muscles and nerves act weirdly when there's low levels of calcium. Uh, some of the causes of hypoparathyroidism is sort of one of the most common ones is iatrogenic when you remove the thyroid gland because the parathyroid glands are in different locations and they're not always visible in a living specimen especially if there's edema and you know the thyroid cancer you can end up cutting out all the parathyroid glands um, and of course there's congenital autoimmune and cancer or radiation things like that pituitary the pituitary gland has an anterior pituitary and a posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary produces growth hormone, prolactin, LH and FSH, ACTH and TSH. The posterior produces ADH and oxytocin. The growth hormone uh, is a hormone that gets released. It goes to the liver where it produces or results in the production of insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1 which then causes growth in the body. High levels of growth hormone, if it's before puberty, will result in gigantism because the growth plates haven't fused, so the long bones just keep growing. If it's after fusion, you get acromegaly where the bones are thick and they have facial dysmorphic features, but they're not a giant. If you've got low levels of growth hormone and it's early in life, you get pituitary dwarfism. If it's late in life, you've already grown your bones and fused them, so you'll be a normal size, but it might have some metabolic and mood and sleep effects that are still kind of being debated. And just last year, growth hormone was placed on the uh, PBS for certain groups of people that have low growth hormone late in life, but don't actually have dwarfism. So that's kind of an evolving space. Here are some slides of gigantism and acromegaly. Things to basically look for are thick bones in the skull. Uh, it's kind of something that if you look at pictures enough times, you, you hopefully won't miss it. And it's quite important because this extra growth puts a lot of strain on the cardiovascular system. So recognizing um, Acromegaly is actually one of the inspection features for your cardiovascular examination in terms of Talian O'Connor. It's kind of like how Marfan syndrome has cardiovascular consequences, and so it's also one of those inspection things. Prolactin. If you have high levels of prolactin, it causes galactorrhea, which is the lactation from the breast tissue. It doesn't cause gynecomastia. Estrogen does that but prolactin causes whatever tissue is there to lactate. High prolactin um, is often caused by antipsychotics because dopamine inhibits the release of prolactin, 
And so when we block dopamine with an antipsychotic, we then disinhibit that pathway and promote hyperlactin. Another cause is a prolactinoma, which is one of the most common pituitary tumors. And that's associated with bitemporal hemianopia because a pituitary adenoma compresses the optic chiasm. If it only compresses sort of the top half or bottom half, depending on you know, the angles of things in 3D space, uh, you might get a inferior or superior uh, bitemporal quadrantinopia, which then progresses into a hemianopia on one side because the tumor might go diagonally and it'll only completely compress you know, one side of the optic chiasm, but not the other. ACTH uh, coming from the pituitary. We know in Cushing's uh, disease, that's when you've got a tumor that produces ACTH. Um, secondary Addison's is, you know, keep it in mind that if ACTH gets uh, low from the pituitary, either iatrogenically from uh, stopping corti corticosteroids abruptly or uh, from damage to the pituitary, that can lead to Addison's from the pituitary. TSH, we know our hyper, hyper and hypothyroidism, it can actually come from the pituitary itself, where you've either got too much or too little TSH coming from the pituitary. Pituitary adenomas can be micro or macro adenomas. Micro adenomas typically don't do anything. Macro adenomas, they can be functional or non-functional. Functional macroadenomas can produce any hormone, essentially, uh, but most commonly they produce prolactin. And the second most common is that they produce growth hormone. Then is Cushing's disease with ACTH. And finally is TSH. So most pituitary adenomas produce prolactin. The next most common is growth hormone. Cushing's disease is actually quite uncommon. Cushing's syndrome is much more common. Don't forget about bitemporal hemianopia. This is a good mnemonic to remember. Uh, go look for the adenoma, please. If uh, it reminds you of the order in which hormone function is lost when you have an adenoma. So when you have an adenoma, it grows and it compresses the tissues around it. So most commonly it's a prolactinoma. So most commonly prolactin is the last hormone to disappear. If the prolactinoma compresses the tissue of the pituitary, the first hormone you lose is typically growth hormone, followed by LH, FSH, TSH, and ACTH. GLF, TAP, go look for the adenoma please. So if someone has a deficiency in these hormones and it, you know, it's progressing and they're losing different ones at each follow-up, uh, or they've already lost you know, GH, LH, FSH, and TSH, then you know that this person probably has a pituitary adenoma. Don't forget about bitemporal hemianopia and of course all the other visual pathway deficits. Uh, compression of the optic chiasm because it's the nasal fibers of the retina which take in the temporal visual field. They cross over at the optic chiasm. Compression of the optic chiasm by a pituitary adenoma will cause bitemporal hemianopia. Uh, the medical therapy for prolactinoma is a dopamine agonist. So remember that dopamine inhibits the release of prolactin. So clearly it has some sort of inhibitory effect on those cells. It turns out that if you've got a pituitary adenoma that's a prolactinoma, these drugs can actually physically shrink the prolactinoma. Drugs like bromocryptine and cabergoline are most commonly used. I think bromocryptine is the one they used in the PBL case. So these drugs are dopamine agonists, which of course means they can have bad side effects. So they can cause psychotic features uh, because they're kind of like the opposite of an antipsychotic in a way. Congratulations on making it through the sort of endocrine 
component of this lecture. Uh, this next part is sort of more the metabolic half of endocrine. So diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Let's talk about diabetes. Primary diabetes, type 1 and type 2 are what we know. Type 1 is an immune pathogenesis involving autoimmune destruction of pancreatic islet cells with severe insulin deficiency, which prevents the use of glucose in skeletal tissues, and when it's untreated can result in diabetic ketoacidosis, where because the tissues are starving, they use fat metabolism, which produces acidic ketones, and at the same time you'll have hyperglycemia because the glucose is left in the blood. Whereas in type 2, it's a multifactorial condition involving, you know, obesity, some genetic factors, multiple factors from the lifestyle, a high calorie diet. You get insulin resistance, and then over the years, you'll eventually get insulin deficiency with chronic insulin resistance. The equivalent emergency is hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. HHS, also known as hyperosmolar hypoglycemic non-ketotic state, which is HHNK or HONK, it has a mortality rate of about 40%. DKA only has a mortality rate of 4%. So it, all, it, it occurs in people that are old, dehydrated, comorbid, and you know have had poorly controlled type 2 diabetes for a long time potentially and typically have another disease at the same time, like sepsis or a heart attack, you can see why the mortality is so high, even though they're quite similar conditions. The chronic complications of long-term diabetes can be broken up into macrovascular and microvascular. Macrovascular, the large vessels, include the cerebral vessels for stroke, the heart for the coronary vessels, myocardial infarction, and the peripheral circulation for peripheral arterial disease. Microvascular complications include the kidney, the retina, and the small vessels supplying the nerve sheath. Hyperglycemia is also directly toxic to nerves. Uh, the, the first sort of microvascular change is diabetic retinopathy. And if someone presents with diabetic nephropathy, which can be detected by uh, albumin being present in the urine, microalbuminuria at first, people at that stage almost definitely have some degree of diabetic retinopathy. Maybe it's been missed. So it, the eye is first, then the kidney. And if they have peripheral neuropathy, you can guarantee that they have nephropathy and retinopathy. If they have neuropathy, there's a good chance they have peripheral arterial disease and atherosclerosis and are at a high risk of stroke and MI. All of these complications are worse in type 1 diabetes because it's more difficult to achieve glycemic control because, you know, if you don't take insulin, your body has no insulin. Whereas at least in type 2 diabetes, even if you're on insulin, your body can at least produce a little bit of basal insulin to soften those hyperglycemic peaks. Diabetic neuropathy. There are a couple of different kinds. Here are some I've highlighted. So you've got the sensory neuropathy, which is the loss of proprioception and vibration sensation in the peripheral limbs, especially the hands and feet paresthesias like pins and needles or just not feeling your feet. There's another version of this which is a, a, an acute pain neuropathy where they get a painful neurasthesia. Then there's autonomic neuropathy where the both parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system fibers are damaged and if it's damaged to the gut you'll get gastroparesis which is delayed gastric emptying, constipation, diarrhea, postural hypotension, sexual issues. If you get low blood sugar, you won't be able to notice it because it's the sympathetic nervous system that gives you your tachys when you get hypoglycemic, issues with sweating, and then an awful condition called diabetic amyotrophy, 
which is where you get degeneration of the lumbosacral plexus, typically unilaterally, and you get wasting of the hip and thigh muscles, especially the quadriceps, and it really hurts. It's the most painful diabetic complication. Diabetic foot is something to really understand well, is it's a consequence of poor blood flow, poor nervous innervation, together meaning that, you know, if you can't feel, it's very easy to cut your foot and not notice it and not clean it. And then having poor blood flow and hypoglycemia mean it's hard to heal that wound. And the hypoxia caused by poor blood flow will provide an anaerobic environment for some very nasty bacteria to grow, which don't normally grow on the skin. And uh, these things can get so bad that you end up with ulcers that require the amputation of toes, feet, or legs. Another condition to know about is Charcot's foot. It's kind of way more complex than you'd expect. It, it involves inflammation from diabetes and an actual change in the meta in metabolic activity of the bones in the feet. Basically, it, it's just a, a deformity of the foot that's associated with diabetes. You end up with rocker bottom feet, so they're, they're curved on the bottom. For diabetic foot testing, we use that uh, monofilament, which provides a specific amount of pressure for two reasons. One is it's standardized, and two, it means that you can't accidentally go poke a hole with a little pinprick in someone's poor little foot. Uh, the sites that you touch are, you know, one on the back of the foot, and then on the bottom of the foot, where it's widest, you do three, then three, and then where it becomes more narrow, you do two, and then one on the heel. It's very easy to remember, it's just wherever it's wide, you do more, and then you kind of, it comes down in a triangle. In terms of interpreting that examination, um, I found this guideline, but it kind of confuses me with the way they've worded things, but basically, when you do that monofilament test, you're checking uh, for what's called the sort of sensory protection of the foot. If there's been a loss of that sensory protection, that is basically if on the plantar surface of the foot, you've lost one of these nine places. So just one of those is a loss of protective sensation. The less than eight sites and the greater than eight sites, my brain can't process what that sentence means. No feeling in less than eight sites. But I looked it up in another guideline and basically just, yeah, say eight of these were positive and one didn't have feeling, that's enough to upgrade them from low risk to increased risk. The difference then between increased risk and high risk is whether there's skin changes. An emergency is when there's an infection or an ulcer. The lower limb examination, uh, it's a problematic OSCE station in the past, but basically just make it up as you go. Be systematic, inspect, palpate, auscultate, and then get them to do special movements. In terms of inspection, look at the skin, look for ulcers, amputation, redness, uh, varicose veins, venous staining, loss of hair, scars, just look at the leg and comment on anything that could be in terms of skin, blood flow, uh, or injury, an issue. Then palpate. Check for temperature. Temperature tells you how the blood flow is going. Check for peripheral edema. That tells you how the venous drainage is going. Check for capillary refill. Tells you how the uh, little arterial capillaries are going. Check for calf tenderness and then check the pulses, the popliteal, posterior tibial, and dorsalis pedis. You might not feel the popliteal pulse because it's very tricky, but if you practice the posterior tibial and dorsalis pedis on yourself, they're actually very easy. Uh, for dorsalis pedis, uh, that one's typically okay, 
but for posterior tibial, I had a lot of trouble with that. The trick is basically, if you stretch your foot up, so uh, dorsiflex it, so your toes are going to the roof, so it's really stretched, and then go from the sort of corner of your heel to your medial malleolus, go about halfway while it's stretched, and just feel around in that area, going sort of up and down in a diagonal line, and the pulse is typically there. It's sort of further away from the malleolus than you'd expect. Auscultate, um, you could probably skip this in an osce and it'd be fine, but you're checking the abdominal aorta and the renal arteries to see if there's, you know, signs of a big atherosclerotic lesion in the abdominal aorta, which has thrown off clots into the arteries going to the feet, leading to your limb ischemia. So you might hear a brewy because of that. Check the sensation, you know, use your fine touch, your um, sort of gross, you know, cotton wool touch, do vibration and proprioception, and then use the monofilament on the bottom of the foot if they're diabetic. Then get them to move all the joints. And that's kind of it. You could test for coordination as well if you want, but that's more of a brain thing, not really a limb thing. Let's talk about the management of diabetes. So first and foremost, uh, I moved this slide to the beginning. Lifestyle management is a priority in diabetes care. In the same way that, you know, the first thing you do for depression is therapy, not SSRI, goodbye, it's lifestyle management. So diet and exercise. There's lots of debate about what the best diet is, but basically a diet that's rich in whole foods, lots of different vegetables, that has a tailored total caloric intake to promote weight loss if they're overweight, or at least, you know, a steady maintenance weight if, if they're not overweight, with plenty of fruit and vegetables. There's no need to reduce fruit, you know. Just because diabetics have high blood sugar doesn't mean that they can't eat sugar. You know, it's a symptom of the disease. It doesn't mean that sugar itself causes insulin resistance. It's insulin resistance that causes hyperglycemia. So, you know, a diabetic can eat watermelon and it's fine. And the idea that, you know, sugar is the main thing causing insulin issues is crazy because protein also requires insulin to be um, anabolic, anabolically activated. And uh, there is a very interesting study showing that, you know, per sort of gram of protein, a steak and white potatoes, a steak actually causes more insulin release per gram than white potatoes because protein requires insulin as well. Fat is the only thing that doesn't need insulin. So, you know, you can cut out sugar all you want, but anytime you eat meat or any protein, you're stimulating insulin as well. So the idea that, you know, sugar is bad is missing the point, I think. Calories are bad. Eating excess calories for, you know, a chronic period of time combined with inactivity and some genetic predisposition, that's how diabetes happens. Not from eating watermelon. Physical activity itself can cause insulin independent uh, uptake of glucose to improve glycemic control, but now they're also finding that, you know, it can actually improve the ability of the skeletal muscle to react to insulin. So you can actually reverse insulin resistance through a diet and exercise program. So this area is constantly evolving and you know, some people are very nihilistic and they say, oh, look, it's impossible to get my patients to lose weight and exercise. It's just not going to happen. This is all pseudoscience. I'm just going to ignore it. But I think, you know, the motivational interviewing approach given in a genuine ep empathetic way to someone who wants to listen, we should tell them the truth that if they go hard on the diet and exercise and do it right, there's a good chance that they could really change their life. 
it's not really up to the doctor to say, oh, I don't think my patient would be willing to do that. It's up to the patient to listen, and we should at least try. With that uh, big long rant out of the way, let's talk about drugs. Here's the best guideline for diabetes, the Royal College of GPs Diabetes Management Guideline. On the front cover is a French lilac, which is the plant from which biguanides are derived, which metformin is a biguanide. And here's their guideline for type 2 diabetes. First line is metformin. You start at 500 milligrams, you go up to one gram. If they've got bad kidneys, you stay at one gram. If they've got good kidneys, you go up to one gram twice a day. Easy. If after, say, three months, metformin isn't, you know, doing anything for you, the HbA1c hasn't really changed, uh, you know, the best you'll get out of metformin is sort of 0.5 to 1%. So if their HbA1c is like 9%, you might even start with two agents straight off the bat. But anyway, if you're not achieving the target with metformin alone, you can add a second agent. The most common second agent is a sulfonylurea, uh, something like glibenclamide. Sulfonylureas have a risk of hypoglycemia, shouldn't be used in the elderly, uh, but they're cheap and effective, so they're still very commonly used. And, you know, I met someone that was 75 the other day whose GP still had them on a sulfonylurea. Uh, they were in the hospital with hypoglycemia, so, yeah. DPP-4 inhibitors and SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, DPP-4 inhibitors are things like citagliptin, linagliptin. SGLT2 inhibitors uh, are things like empagliflozin. Both are great. SGLT2 inhibitors in a recent trial showed protective effects on the kidney and the heart. Uh, so, you know, We'll see where the evidence goes with that, but I think people are really keen on SGLT2 inhibitors at the moment. So then if you combine those two drugs and they're still not working, you can combine a third drug. So whatever drug you didn't add, you can now add the other one. Or now that you're up to a third line therapy, you could add a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So something like exenatide which is actually a subcutaneous injection. All the, G the GLP-1 analogs are injectables. So that's something that you need to consider in terms of tolerance and uh, ongoing, uh, you know, whether the person's going to take it or not. So, you know, you could combine a DPP-4, an SGLT-2 and metformin. That would be a reasonable combination. Or at this point, if you think it's therapeutically t appropriate and the person is willing, you can try insulin. If you know, you're know you on these three drugs and now uh, things still aren't working, you go to this final line of change one of the agents to be a GLP-1 receptor agonist or insulin or another oral agent. And if you're already on a GLP-1 receptor agonist and it's not working for you, so that was one of your third line choices, you can change it to insulin. And if you're already on insulin, you can add a different drug. You can add a receptor agonist, or you can add a new plan that is sort of similar to how type 1 diabetes is managed and do basal bolus insulin. And we'll talk about insulin a little bit later. So to make this simple, one, metformin, two, something else, sulfonylurea, SGLT2, or DPP4. Step three, consider insulin. That's sort of the simple way of looking at it. And at the same time, you know, maybe consider something like exenatide, the GLP-1 analog, the, but remember that it's injectable. And you'll notice that uh, thiazolidine diones and acarbose were never highlighted in blue. So these drugs exist, but only the things that are blue are what are recommended by evidence. So I think these two are going to disappear.
Thiazolidine dions are contraindicated in heart failure, just as a random fact. So metformin, the way it works is it prevents the liver from making sugar, it prevents intestinal absorption of sugar, and it makes your peripheral tissues more sensitive to insulin in order to promote glucose uptake. It's derived from the French lilac, which is the cover of the guideline. If you've got bad kidneys, you need to adjust the dose, so you only go to one gram max dose. And that's because you can increase the risk of lactic acidosis, which is a very rare association, but the risk of it is higher in bad kidneys and also higher when giving uh, contrast for imaging. So when you order a CT scan with contrast, they'll ask you if the person's on metformin or not. It causes malabsorption of B12, so you should monitor their full blood count and give IM B12, you know, six monthly, yearly, whatever. And the most common side effects are GI side effects, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. You can mitigate that by giving metformin controlled release preparations. It's still the same dose, but it's a it's sort of extended release. And it means that you can give metformin uh, despite having sort of poor GI tolerance. If the extended release is still not tolerated, then you need to sort of rethink things because metformin is an awesome drug. And I think even with some nausea, you might try and push through it and see if, you know, with drinking lots of fluids and having a regular routine, if maybe that nausea could be mitigated while still taking metformin. It doesn't cause hypoglycemia and it helps you lose weight and reduces your appetite. Sulfonylureas are things like glibenclamide, glycolazide. It uh, makes potassium stay inside the pancreatic cells, which depolarizes them and causes the release of insulin. So even when your glucose uh, hasn't touched the pancreas, you tell the pancreas to release insulin. That's where the risk of hypoglycemia happens is if your glucose is low, Normally, your pancreas wouldn't dare to release insulin, but with sulfonylureas, they'll force it to release it. So you could have a blood sugar of four, take your daily glibenclamide, which is a long-acting sulfonylurea, and crash down to two and, you know, be very unwell. So don't use it in the elderly. Glibenclamide is available combined with metformin as glucovans. And the issue there is, you know, if someone's used to taking metformin, you know, taking three tablets, two tablets, doesn't really matter. But if you then give them glucovance and you, you know, titrate it to a certain sulfonylurea daily dose, it'd be not good if they were like, oh, I'm going to take an extra metformin today because I'm eating cake or something. And then they've overdosed on sulfonylurea because they didn't know it was in the glucovans. They're associated with weight gain. That's a big negative for sulfonylureas as well as the risk of hypos. DPP-4 inhibitors like citagliptin or linagliptin, they inhibit DPP-4, which increases GLP-1, which promotes glucose-dependent insulin secretion. So they don't really cause hypos on their own because they're just making the pancreas better at doing its job. So if the glucose is low, the pancreas won't release any insulin. But when the glucose is high, the GLP-1 will help the pancreas to release insulin properly. If you combine it with a sulfonylurea or insulin, it, it can make hypoglycemia worse. And this is because DPP-4 inhibitors reduce glucagon synthesis, which means there's no stimulus to, for the liver to produce glucose. So if the sulfonylurea drops your glucose, you'll then dampen the response via glucagon. It can be combined with metformin as genumet, which is available on the PBS, and it's beneficial for weight loss. One other random thing I learned today is that a version of the DPP-4 inhibitors, which is linagliptin, uh, it, it can be used in people with renal failure whereas citagliptin has to be dose adjusted. And so most commonly, if people are on linagliptin, it's because they have chronic kidney disease.
Here's just a diagram of, you know, the DPP4 enzyme breaks down the incretins, which include GLP-1. DPP-4 inhibitors block that to increase GLP-1, which promotes insulin and reduces glucagon and causes a lowering of blood glucose. SGLT2 inhibitors, the glyphlazins, such as empagliflazin, it blocks SGLT2, preventing the reabsorption of sugar and sodium in the kidney, so you pee out sugar. Uh, there's, there's a really important adverse effect, which is euglycemic ketoacidosis. So even with normal blood sugar, these people for some reason can go into ketoacidosis. That's really scary. And even more scary is perineal necrotizing fasciitis, or fornia's gangrene, which is a necrotizing gangrene of the perineum, which is your genital area. That's really bad. As well as that, because you've got more sugar in your urine, you're predisposed to urinary tract infections, genital candida, um, and a diuretic effect, which will cause you know, uh, low blood volume, potentially hypotension, postural hypotension, syncope, so on. But they're very protective against uh, you know, heart failure and chronic kidney disease. They maintain heart and kidney function uh, because of multiple reasons. And they can actually directly reduce albuminuria, which is one of those markers that if someone goes from intermittent albuminuria, so every so often they pee out a bit of protein, to persistent albuminuria, it means that within five to ten years they're going to be in end-stage renal failure and need dialysis. But these drugs seem to reduce the uh, you know, onset of um, persistent albuminuria. So maybe they can delay the time from diagnosis to needing dialysis, and that would be incredible. Um, when I was on neurology, one of the consultants randomly pimped me and said, oh, what's the name of the trial that showed that they were renoprotective? Uh, you shouldn't know that. Con consultants ask you insane questions, but turns out that it's the EMPA-REG outcome trial. And because that was such a weird question, I'm going to remember that forever now. Thiazolidine diones, which I think are just going to be phased out, um, include pioglitazone. They're an agonist against peroxisome proliferator activator receptor gamma, PPRY. Uh, and that is a, a gene that controls a family of genes that regulate lipid and glucose metabolism. You should recall that fibrates, like phenofibrate, managing uh, high triglycerides and cholesterol, they also interact with the PPAR family of receptors. The thiazolidine diones increase peripheral sensitivity to insulin, and they reduce hepatic gluconeogenesis through complex mechanisms. But they cause fluid retention, and they can worsen heart failure, and they're associated with weight gain. GLP-1 analogs, like exenatide, uh, they're a subcutaneous injectable, and basically, they do the same thing as DPP-4 inhibitors, but they actually do it a little bit better. So they increase the secretion of insulin, they reduce glucagon, and they actually slow down gastric emptying, which prevents those hyperglycemic spikes when you eat because your food is more slowly absorbed. And they promote weight loss. I just wanted to give a brief overview of the different types of insulin. You don't have to remember this for your exams, but all the doctors in the hospital next year will for some reason expect you to know it. The ones that I've seen in the hospital are Nova Rapid and Humalog, and they are uh, the short-acting insulins. So they're the ones that you give at the time of a meal, and they just give a little spike of insulin that's enough to help absorb the extra carbohydrates and protein coming from that meal. So Nova Rapid is very commonly used. In terms of long-acting insulin, the most common long-acting one is insulin glargine, which is opticillin, previously known as Lantus. Everyone knows the brand name Lantus. Uh, just 
they did an incredible marketing campaign, I guess, and they were the dominant brand forever. They are long acting insulins, uh, including this protophane inolet, which is one that I've seen used a lot for gestational diabetes. These are what you take either in the morning or at night, and they can last, you know, 12 to 24 hours. They give you a basal insulin. They hang around for the whole day, and that's kind of your baseline insulin that just constantly keeps you going. So you've got that basal insulin, and every time you eat, you add a little bolus of a fast-acting, short-lasting insulin, such as Nova Rapid or Humalog. That's what basal bolus dosing is. So you've got your basal insulin, and then boluses with each meal. This is an attempt to mimic what the pancreas normally does. On this final area of the table, um, these are mixed insulins. It's a combination of sort of medium acting and long acting or short acting and long acting, intermediate, so on. They're basically designed that you can take them twice a day and they give you the same effect as basal bolus, just instead of having you know, one injection of basal and then three injections of bolus, sometimes four, you just have to stab yourself twice. Uh, in the hospital, they typically do the basal bolus. In the community, I'm sure these things are more popular. Ooh, that was type two diabetes. Well done on surviving that. Let's finish off the metabolic topics. I just wanna talk about metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is when you've got three or more of the following. Insulin resistance, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, a uh, low level of good cholesterol and abdominal obesity. So these are very common conditions and when three or more of them are together, it tells you that there's this thing called the metabolic syndrome, which they don't totally understand the, you know, the interconnectedness of these things, but it probably all relates to insulin resistance in some way but essentially you've got problems with sugar, lipids, and blood pressure. And all of that together means that you're gonna have a bad time in terms of your risk of heart attack, kidney failure, going blind, everything like that. So you want to manage each of these things. Someone comes in for diabetes management, you discover they have metabolic syndrome. Firstly, you want them to lose 10% of their weight. You wanna control their blood pressure, you wanna put them on a statin, you wanna put them on a fibrate to control their triglycerides. And uh, once that's all done, you've hopefully done a good job. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So previously, alcoholic fatty liver disease was all that was known, but now with the obesity epidemic, there's this idea of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This diagram from Robbins and Catran is a very good summary. So what basically happens is people with insulin resistance, they end up getting fatty liver, hepatic steatosis. Over time, a certain group of people with fatty liver, uh, they will go on to get non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So they've got fat in the liver and it gets inflamed. Not everyone gets that though. Greater than 80% of people will just have fatty liver and they'll die with it. It's okay. The ones that go on to get this NASH, the steatohepatitis, a certain proportion of them will go on to get cirrhosis. The ones with cirrhosis, you know, a third of them over time will become decompensated and go into liver failure, which can be fatal very rapidly. And if they don't go into that, they have an increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma from that chronic inflammation. The bottom text here uh, is that it's the most common cause of chronic liver disease in the Western world. And it's going to be the leading indication for liver transplant greater than hepatitis C. That's how bad the obesity epidemic is, is that
the primary indication for liver transplant is going to be fatty liver disease that has progressed to NASH and decompensation. Okay, let's talk quickly about the kidneys. Um, I'm currently putting together a systems review of the renal genitourinary system. Uh, so have a look at that as well as this lecture to kind of make sure you're not missing too much. But honestly, kidneys isn't really a massive topic for any of the exams. Firstly, I just wanted to quickly revise diuretics. Um, you don't need to understand the full mechanisms of how each of them work, but the thing I like to kind of go back to is what electrolytes um, change with a diuretic and what happens to acid-base status. And these slides do a really good job of summarizing that. <clears throat> so the first uh, place that we talk about diuretics is in the proximal convoluted tubule where carbonic anhydrase inhibitors were once used. They're a thing of the past now in terms of diuresis, but they're still used for other indications like glaucoma or preventing uh, elevation sickness if you go mountain climbing. Basically, all you need to know about carbonic anhydrase inhibitors is that the movement of bicarb is involved in the movement of fluid in multiple areas in the body, including in the eye. Um, and that's why it's a medication used for glaucoma because it can alter the production of aqueous humor. It causes a metabolic acidosis because it interferes with the reabsorption of bicarbonate. And because you're not reabsorbing bicarbonate, you stop reabsorbing as much sodium. And so that's why it results in a diuresis. In the distal convoluted tubule, then the sort of quite commonly used class of drugs, thiazide diuretics act, they block the sodium chloride symporter in the DCT. So again, you don't reabsorb as much sodium. It causes diuresis. The other thing that happens here is that because the charge of the urine becomes more positive, or because the inside of the cell becomes more negative, they're the same thing really, more calcium is pushed from the urine and pulled into the cell. So this increases calcium reabsorption. So one thing that thiazide diuretics do is they can increase reabsorption of calcium and they even lead to hypercalcemia. They also can cause metabolic alkalosis. That's because if you look at this channel at the bottom of the diagram, that extra sodium that's in the urine will get exchanged for hydrogen ions, resulting in alkalosis. Sodium goes back into the body and hydrogen goes out of the body. I wanted to just quickly mention some unique points about thiazide diuretics. This is a diagram that explains some mechanisms of how thiazide diuretics make gout worse. Thiazide diuretics interfere with the excretion of urate, so they increase uric acid in the body and they can make gout worse. They can also make diabetes worse or even cause diabetes, but the benefits of their use in hypertension outweigh the risks associated with diabetes, so they continue to be used. In the ascending loop, uh, which really this class should come before the thiazide diuretics, but I just wanted to put that together with the uh, point about gout and diabetes. Uh, this is one of the most commonly used drugs in heart failure. It's a loop diuretic. So for example, frusamide, known as Lasix, it blocks the reabsorption of sodium, potassium, and chloride in the ascending loop. Okay, so we talked about drugs acting in the PCT, the DCT, and here we're talking about the loop. Because such a significant proportion of water reabsorption happens here, loop diuretic, diuretics cause quite a profound diuresis. You can lose like 20 kilograms of water weight quite rapidly. Now, normally the reabsorption of ions in the loop of Henle, it makes the inside of the cell 
quite repulsive for potassium, which makes potassium go out into the uh, urine, and that makes the urine positively charged, which pushes calcium and magnesium from the urine back into the body. So if you don't have the first step of reabsorbing these ions, the urine will become more negatively charged and it will hold on to calcium and magnesium. So loop diuretics can cause low levels of calcium and magnesium. Similarly to thiazide diuretics, they can cause an alkalosis because sodium gets exchanged for hydrogen at a different transporter. And they can also cause hypokalemia. Thiazide diuretics also cause hypokalemia, and we'll talk about that mechanism here at the collecting duct. Here at the collecting duct is where spironolactone, uh, amylaride, and a couple of other diuretics act, and they are the potassium sparing diuretics. All other diuretics that cause potassium loss do so here in the kidney. The way it happens is basically if you look at this sodium channel and this potassium channel, if um, the amount of sodium in the urine at the point of the collecting duct is increased, there's more sodium going in, and that movement of positive charge in pushes the positively charged potassium out. So any drug that causes increased delivery of sodium to the collecting duct will result in increased potassium excretion. So that's why thiazide diuretics and loop diuretics can cause hypokalemia. It's because anything that increases sodium to the end of the nephron will cause potassium loss. The, the drugs that act here, spironolactone works at the level of the gene to prevent the expression of both the sodium channel and the sodium potassium pump. <clears throat> Other drugs work directly on these uh, epithelial sodium channels, ENACs, to block the reabsorption of sodium. They're non-hormonal, so that's a drug like amylaride, whereas spironolactone is a hormone which binds to a steroid response protein and actually causes changes to gene transcription. Amylaride is just a normal drug which binds to a protein, being the sodium channel, to stop sodium reabsorption. Because it interferes with sodium reabsorption, it prevents potassium excretion. And that's why these diuretics are potassium sparing and even have a risk of causing hyperkalemia. Next, I want to talk about vesicourethral reflux, VUR. This condition is worth knowing um, because you might see it in pediatrics <clears throat> and because it was a PBL case, so it can be examined. There's a primary and a secondary type. In the primary type, it's basically a congenital defect where the portion of the ureter that sits inside of the bladder wall is short. And so when the bladder is full, normally that stretching of the bladder wall compresses the uh, you know, portion of the ureter inside the bladder wall closed, uh, preventing any reflux at the vesicourethric junction. If the portion inside the bladder is short, then that sort of compression is less effective in preventing any reflux of urine from the bladder back into the ureter. So people with this condition can have urine going from their bladder back up into their kidneys which causes direct damage due to the urine and hydronephrosis, but also promotes uh, kidney infections and increases the ability for them to ascend from the urethra to the bladder to the kidney itself. Chronic uh, inflammation to the kidney, secondary to urine reflux and in infections, can cause chronic kidney disease later in life. <clears throat> Secondary reflux can occur whenever the bladder outlet is obstructed. So for example, posterior urethral valves are worth knowing next year for pediatrics as a congenital uh, change, but also uh, you know, uh, prostate issues blocking the outflow of urine, uh, 
uh, urethral strictures, uh, anything basically that prevents urine from going out can increase the pressure so much in the bladder that it forces it back up into the ureters. Uh, this is just a little bit about what we talked about there, that it increases urinary tract infections um, and can damage the kidney over time. Generally, it gets better on its own though. As the bladder grows, that intramural portion may increase, and so it may resolve on its own spontaneously. But if it's not, then, you know, medically you can give antibiotics, and surgically you can do a couple of procedures that will restore normal um, pre prevention of reflux. <clears throat> uh, as I said, you can get infections going up to the kidneys and eventually chronic kidney disease. Here in this pilogram, you can see that the right ureter has urine during micturition going from the bladder down the urethra, but also back up on the right ureter. Kidney stones. So there's a bunch of different stones, and the things that you should remember are that calcium oxalate are the most common, that uric acid stones occur in gout, struvite stones occur in UTIs, and cysteine stones occur when people have genetic conditions that alter the reabsorption of cysteine, uh, which is an amino acid. That's the main stuff that you should know. Uh, the Struvite stones are also known uh, to cause staghorn calculus in their morphology. <clears throat> and one thing to be aware of is that for the calcium-based stones, they can happen whenever there's hypercalcemia, for example, secondary to hyperparathyroidism. The features of any kidney stone will be a severe unilateral colicky flank pain, which I've spelt wrong in this slide. It radiates from the loin to the groin, and that'll change depending on where it is within the ureter because of the spinal innervation of the ureter. You'll get blood in the urine, nausea and vomiting, and unlike peritonitis, where the person wants to keep really still and not let their abdomen move, like um, in a late stage appendicitis or something, this person will be rolling around in bed in pain. They just can't keep still because they've just got this colicky pain going down their back. The investigations, um, the best one is an abdominal CT scan without any contrast. The reason being that when contrast fills the ureter as it's being excreted, that bright white fluid in the ureter might hide a stone. But also ultrasound can help because you'll de detect hydronephrosis and certain types of stones will be visible on ultrasound. The treatment is to provide hydration, analgesia, potentially antibiotics if it's associated with a UTI. And depending on the etiology, you can treat that. So hypercalcemia can be treated directly. Um, other things like, for example, the antibiotics for UTI causing stones. You can do the, all the different surgical things to break up big stones that won't be passed, but for the most part, most stones can be passed naturally with conservative measures. <clears throat> if someone has bad hydrouretor and you're worried about them getting hydronephrosis and acute kidney injury, you can do percutaneous nephrostomy to drain the uh, you know, urethral pelvis and relieve that pressure on the kidney. Acute kidney injury. The best way to understand this is firstly the definition. Uh, the, the easiest definition is to say that there's been a 50% increase in creatinine within the past two days or within the past seven days above baseline or an increase of 27 micromoles um, at any point. The kidney injury can be before the kidney, at the kidney, or after the kidney, pre, intra, and post renal. Pre renal, the things to think about is it's all to do with stuff that prevents blood from getting to the kidney. <clears throat> so things like hypovolemia, which can be 
from diuresis, diarrhea, dehydration or bleeding, reduced cardiac output, loss of fluid, so like nephrotic syndrome when you've got low albumin, the fluid is no longer inside the vessels, cirrhosis, the same reason with low albumin, or renovascular disease, you know, if there's blockage of the renal arteries, you'll have less blood flow to the kidney. A renal cause could be in the glomerulus or in the interstitium and tubule. And there's quite a few different primary kidney conditions there, but be aware of glomerulonephritis, especially post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, and be aware of acute tubular necrosis. Post-renal conditions are some of the things we talked about that could be the same things that cause vesicourethric reflux, so posterior urethral valves, BPH, tumours, and stones. Kidney stones reduce GFR because they increase the hydrostatic pressure within Bowman's capsule, which decreases the gradient from the capillaries into the capsule to reduce filtration. With reduced net filtration, you end up with a reduced GFR. Kidney injury happens in phases, and this isn't really essential to know, but it's just good to have a general idea that, you know, some event occurs, and it could just be severe dehydration. Uh, that's what it most commonly is in the hospital. And then within the next week after that event, the GFR drops, the creatinine rises, you begin to have electrolyte abnormalities and acidosis. And that's typically how you notice it. You'll see someone has a high potassium, then you'll see that their creatinine's high, and you put two and two together and you know that it's happening in the kidney. Then everything goes back to normal and they have an increased urine production and then eventually it all gets better. Chronic kidney disease. So this is different from an acute kidney injury. This is the long-term kidney failure that gets progressively worse. The most common causes are diabetes and high blood pressure, but it can also be after an inflammatory insult like glomerulonephritis or PKD or some kind of urological disease like the case with vesicourethric reflux. Grading of chronic kidney disease is based on the albumin creatinine ratio in their urine, which basically just tells you how much protein is coming out in the urine. The more protein that goes out in the urine, the worse their kidneys are working in terms of filtration. And GFR. So as the and a GFR greater than 90 is normal, and as it gets down to less than 15, that's severe kidney failure end-stage renal disease. When it comes to albumin in the urine, there's uh, what you call intermittent albuminuria, which is every so often they will lose protein in the urine. That typically occurs in the early phase of disease, typically diabetes, and then it becomes a per persistent microalbuminuria where it's always there, and then it might become a macroalbuminuria where it's detectable without having to use the highly sensitive measuring devices. And that would be the very final stages of kidney failure. Um, you don't need to memorize all of this, but just be aware that with chronic kidney disease, you can have high blood pressure or you can have issues to do with fluid balance in the body. And because of the retention of organic toxins, you get something called uremia, which is not due to urea. Urea is harmless, but it's called uremia because it's characterized by high urea, secondary to the kidney failure. You get tired, you have headaches, you have itching of the skin, anemia. Uremic pericarditis is good to know, so someone with kidney failure who presents with pericarditis, you should consider that it could be uremic pericarditis. Basically, every organ in the body gets unwell. And we know about chronic kidney disease mineral bone disorder, that's the secondary hyperparathyroidism from the urinary loss of calcium that results in continuous bone breakdown. Um, before I talk about hemodialysis, I just want to go back to acute kidney injury 
Something that you don't need to know now, but I just wanted to mention is that if an acute kidney injury is pre-renal, it's typically because of dehydration. Now, there are two things that we talk about in the kidney and that are tested commonly on blood tests. It's urea and creatinine. Creatinine isn't freely reabsorbed in the kidney. So most creatinine that comes from muscle breakdown is filtered into the urine and then lost in the urine. Whereas urea is freely lost in the urine, but then also reabsorbed with water whenever you reabsorb water. So if you put that together, if someone's dehydrated, they will be constantly trying to reabsorb water because of antidiuretic hormone release. And within that water, they'll be reabsorbing a lot of urea. So their urea goes up. But the creatinine doesn't get reabsorbed, so the creatinine in the blood doesn't go up. Putting that together, we can make something called a urea-creatinine ratio. When you put those together, if someone is dehydrated and it's a pre-renal kidney injury, the amount of urea relative to the amount of creatinine in the blood, the urea should go up because it's reabsorbed in the water, whereas creatinine is not reabsorbed. And in Australian units, which we use different units to America, the urea creatinine ratio, if it's greater than 100, this suggests a pre-renal acute kidney injury because you're reabsorbing lots of urea when you're dehydrated. In other cases of kidney injury, there won't be that reabsorption of urea and so the ratio won't be so high. And there's another ratio, um, but that's the main one to sort of have off the top of your head is greater than 100, it's likely pre-renal dehydration. Talking about hemodialysis, uh, quickly. Um, when someone has symptoms of uremia, that's an indication for hemodialysis. But the other basic ones, you can reason them out and you can remember them with this AEIOU um, acronym. Acid base, electrolytes, especially hyperkalemia that's become significantly high. Intoxication is a, when you're in the emergency room, that can be an acute um, hemodialysis indication if you've had some poison that can be hemodialyzed out of the blood which not very many actually can there's like a small handful if you're fluid overloaded so you've got um, pleural effusions pulmonary edema pericardial effusion peripheral edema on the limbs and a scar of the face or uremic symptoms the other thing I put on this slide is a comparison of the composition of dialysate to plasma. Something to note is that the potassium is lower than the normal plasma level. That's to try and pull potassium out of the blood. Yeah, by All of this works by a diffusion gradient. So you can treat hyperkalemia by putting a low amount of potassium in the dialysate. People with chronic kidney disease, they get chronic loss of calcium, so you add calcium to the dialysate, but if you look at the number, 1.5 looks much lower than the normal plasma amount, but that plasma amount is, uh, it's actually including calcium that's bound to albumin, whereas the calcium in the dialysate is free calcium. So the 1.5 free calcium is actually higher than the body's normal free calcium. So that gradient will actually go from the dialysate into the blood. And then of course, there are no toxins in the dialysate and there are toxins in the plasma. So those uremic toxins will float from the plasma into the dialysate. And that's the principle of dialysis. It's just concentration gradients going both ways, depending on which one's got a higher concentration than the other. Uh, just notes about dialysis. Uh, if someone's going to have dialysis long term, a vascular surgeon can create an arteriovenous fistula, which is used to make it easier to have dialysis. If someone has an AV fistula, you can't put a cannula in that arm because you risk blowing it up. 
and you can't take a blood pressure on that arm for the same reason. If you put your uh, stethoscope over the AV fistula, it'll sound like a swarm of bees. Um, try remember this. Typically, patients will have a sign outside their door on the renal ward saying, do not cannulate the left arm. This patient has a AV fistula. Just something really good to know for next year that you might not always get told. And it's good for OSCE stations to mention it. You might get a point for that when you're consenting someone to have a cannula. Let's talk about HIV. Here is the diagram of how the HIV virus gets into the body. The HIV virus is an RNA virus and it fuses with host cells through the CD4 receptor and the CCR5 or CXCR4 co-receptors depending on if it's HIV1 or HIV2. When the GP41 protein binds to the CD4 receptor, fusion occurs, the viral contents are endocytosed into the cell and the viral RNA is then in the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm, the protein which the virus has already called reverse transcriptase converts the viral RNA into double-stranded DNA. That double-stranded DNA is then taken up by the host nucleus and with viral integrase it gets integrated into the DNA genome. So the HIV virus is now a part of your actual DNA. When the virus then wants to come out and play, which isn't always, and that's why it can lay dormant for a long time. It transcribes itself using the host RNA polymerase, and that will generate some viral mRNA, which using host ribosomes will be translated into the structural proteins that the virus needs to build itself. Those proteins are then cleaved with protease to chop them into the correct size and make them be functional. At the same time though, if you think about it, the uh, HIV virus is an RNA virus. So if you just use host RNA polymerase and you create RNA based on the DNA that's in the genes, that is the HIV genome, that little RNA strand. You don't have to do anything to that. That is HIV. So if you combine those proteins with the RNA strand and then the whole thing pops out by exocytosis, carrying some of the host cell with the viral proteins in it, in its little capsule, that then is a new copy of HIV. So in short, and the reason I'm going through this is because these are the targets for the antiretroviral drugs, HIV virus, which is an RNA virus, fuses using CD4 and CCR5 via GP41, goes into the cell, the viral RNA gets reverse transcribed into DNA, the DNA gets integrated with integrase, gets transcribed back into RNA, gets translated into protein, which are cleaved to be functional via proteases, and then the viral genome is the viral genome. The whole thing gets packaged together and it buds out into the blood to be a new copy of the HIV virus. In the process, if a whole load of these viruses form, as they leave the host cell, they actually can cause cell lysis, and that's called the lytic cycle of a virus, and that'll kill the host cell. In this case, it will be a white blood cell, either a lymphocyte or a macrophage, because both can have the CD4 co-receptor. The course of HIV infection is essentially that um, in the first six months there's this picture that is often missed. In the first month or so you won't have any symptoms. Maybe in the first three to six weeks you might have a bit of a viral infection where You've basically just got a set of non-specific constitutional symptoms like fever, joints, muscles, tired, swollen lymph nodes, a sore throat, some ulcers and rashing. That, you know, is very easy to confuse with Epstein-Barr virus, which looks identical. 
with a sore throat lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly in Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, the additional features of HIV are some neurological signs like photophobia, and but again, that's kind of rare and, you know, you may forget about that after two days and you'll assume this was the flu. It's only in most cases later or by a screening program that you'll realise that this illness was actually your first HIV infection. It can be up to 10 years until you get symptoms again from a, you know, the AIDS process. Um, something that came up in the PBL case and is good to know is this drug trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, which uh, as a brand combination is called Bactrim, as a generic combination is called cotrimoxazole. These are folate antagonists, which are used to treat and also be prophylaxis for a fungal lung infection called pneumocystis gerevechi pneumoniae, PJP pneumonia. In people with HIV, because of destruction of certain T lymphocytes, of which some of them are T regulatory lymphocytes, which regulate the immune response to antigens, you can get all sorts of weird allergic reactions that you never used to have. One example is that for some reason, when you take Bactrim, you get this rash. And it's for some reason really specific to HIV. If people take Bactrim and get a rash, you should test them for HIV. It's just a really interesting thing and it's well documented. Things that tell you that it's HIV are any of these diseases, basically. These are diseases that define AIDS, the uh, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So fungal infections deep in the lung of the throat, a cervical cancer that has gone beyond the margins, because remember, cervical cancer is sort of defended against by the immune system because it's fighting the HPV virus. Cryptococcal infections, cytomegalovirus doing more damage than it should. So again, these are all kind of viruses that we have and we all have some candida in us, but our immune system keeps it in check. But in AIDS, the immune system fails. And so these organisms, they present in ways that we really wouldn't expect and that should point you towards AIDS. Um, you know, chronic ulcers, histoplasmosis, Kaposi's sarcoma is a condition I've got a picture of later, and also Burkitt's lymphoma, which is a Epstein-Barr virus um, B-cell lymphoma, so a virally caused lymphoma. Again, immunodeficiency will predispose you to getting that lymphoma. lymphoma. Anyone with TB should be checked for HIV, the two go together. Uh, that pneumocystis gerevechi pneumonia, which is a fungal pneumonia, any recurrent pneumonia, you know, certain bacteria being in places they shouldn't, like salmonella sepsis, toxoplasmosis, which we'll talk about in the women's health section. If it's in the brain, that also points towards HIV. And the way I remember that is, you may not have seen it, but if you've seen the movie Train Spotting. Uh, they, there's a guy in train spotting who uses heroin through a used needle, gets HIV, as many people did um, at that time from shared needle use, and he is laying down really sick in his house next to a cat litter tray, and then he dies shortly after. And, and that's toxoplasmosis, which is within the cat litter. Um, and we tell women who are pregnant not to change cat litter, or at least don't do it without sufficient protection, because you can get toxoplasmosis. In HIV, the toxoplasmosis can kill you. Um, we don't use this so much in Australia, but this is the CDC classification of HIV, where you've got the top column of A, B, and C, which is no symptoms, the HIV conditions, or a second set of HIV conditions, and then the CD4 count. The CD4 count is the best predictor of prognosis, 
but we also measure the viral load in terms of RNA copies. Uh, we measure both of those, but if you get an MCQ about prognosis, it's the actual CD4 count that tells you if you're going to live or die. You could have a huge amount of HIV viral load, but have a good amount of CD4 cells and you would be okay. Vice versa, you could have low viral load, but you know, you've got 50 CD4 cells and you know, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Here's Kaposi sarcoma, which is not actually a sarcoma. It's actually a proliferative lesion to do with uh, the walls of blood vessels. So not really um, a sarcoma by the definition of being a, you know, mesenchymal origin tumor, uh, but the name sticks. It's caused by human herpes virus eight when you have AIDS. Some other pathogens, and some of these are from the same list, but um, I'm just putting them there so that, you know, if you read this a couple of times, maybe some of them will stick. Always remember Mycobacterium, Pneumocystis, Cryptococcus, Candida, Aspergillus. Um, the viruses, you know, herpes virus that doesn't clear up on its own, um, HPV, the JC polymyoma virus is a, um, it's a virus that many people have, the John Cunningham virus. It, it, it lays dormant, but if you get immunosuppressed, it can cause a fatal polyleukoencephalopathy uh, of the brain. Um, that's also a point in uh, the treatment of MS. There's one drug that we give for MS, which kind of also um, causes a specific suppression of a certain line of lymphocytes that can make the JC virus come out and damage the brain. So people get screened for that virus every six months when they're on a certain MS treatment. Uh, protozoans like Toxoplasma, Leishmaniasis, etc. HIV testing. Um, you should revise whatever DHC has taught you here or whatever was in your PBL case, but this is just a an algorithm that's the most up-to-date one from up-to-date. Uh, the fourth generation testing is basically it checks for antibodies and then they do a Western blot for viral proteins. So if it's positive, it could either be the HIV-1 or HIV-2 antibody. And then you split that up to figure out if it's HIV-1 versus HIV-2. And at the same time, this gets confirmed by testing the uh, P24 protein on Western blot. And then uh, you can do uh, testing of the RNA um, to really figure out if the person has the virus or not, because you can have false negatives at a couple of stages in this algorithm. Let's talk about treatment. So the NRTIs and NNRTIs are basically the same thing. The nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors are false analogs, which when they get incorporated into the DNA by reverse transcriptase, they will terminate transcription. And so that prevents the virus from being able to turn itself into DNA. The non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors they aren't false analogs, but they are drugs that sit within a pocket of the um, reverse transcriptase enzyme itself and interfere with its activity. So you can combine the two together and they would be um, good if there was any resistance uh, developing. Protease inhibitors. So remember when we talked about the viral proteins get translated, but then to be functional, they need to be cut up by proteases. Protease inhibitors will prevent that. So then the proteins won't be functional. Something to note is that within our body, we have our own proteases. And for some reason, they're really important in the function of our metabolics and um, have a lot to do with diabetes and metabolic syndrome. And when people are on protease inhibitors, because of interfering with our own body's proteases, it predisposes you to diabetes and metabolic syndrome with dyslipidemia. Entry inhibitors or fusion inhibitors, they prevent that very first step. Um, some of them bind to the GP41 viral protein to stop it from connecting with CD4. And a new class of drugs bind directly to the CCR5 co-receptor 
to prevent the virus from being able to use that to fuse. Integrase inhibitors prevent uh, the reverse transcribed viral DNA from being integrated into the host genome. And finally, something you should be aware of is the highly active retroviral therapy, which is a combination of three drugs. So to get around the resistance, which the virus will inevitably develop, if you combine three different drugs, you make the best of both worlds of it's got them, you know, it's tolerable in terms of side effects but it gives you enough efficacy that the chance that the virus could mutate and escape all three targets is so low that we've decided on three drugs. You could do five drugs, right? But then the toxicity wouldn't justify the tiny improvement in the chance that the virus will escape treatment. Currently, the first line therapy is to have a NRTI or a NNRTI, and you can do two of either one, depending on the clinical picture. Um, but if you do do two base analogs, you should do two different bases. So some of them are um, pyrimidines and some of them are purines. So you would want to use uh, two NRTIs where one of them's a pyrimidine and one of them's a purine base, plus an integrase inhibitor. And then depending on the picture, you can change certain things, uh, but those should be the three that you kind of vaguely remember. MS. MS is a chronic autoimmune T cell mediated, but also B cell inflammatory demyelinating disorder of the central nervous system. It's a central condition rather than peripheral like Guillain-Barre. It's a T cell mediated process, so it's not to do with macrophages or neutrophils. It's chronic, um, it's autoimmune, it's not infectious based, uh, and it's demyelinating rather than being an encephalitis. The causation is multifactorial. It, there might be genes involved, they don't know which. There might be infections that trigger things, they don't know which. And low vitamin D is very popular at the moment because the amount of MS is lowest at the equator where they get the most sunlight and highest in Northern Europeans where it's very dark. There are four main types, but really there's like eight nowadays in the modern literature, but the ones to know and the most common one to know would be relapsing remitting MS. In relapsing remitting MS, you have flares of MS and then you go back to baseline and then you have another flare and then you go back. Sometimes you don't always go back to baseline, but more or less, if you map it out, you have a flare and then you go back. Secondary progressive MS is when you initially have that relapsing remitting picture, but then suddenly you get a progression of disease with no remission. So you just keep having those flares in different areas that increase in severity and you don't regain function in those areas. Primary progressive is from the very first flare, you never go back to baseline and you just keep getting worse. Relapsing progressive is sort of a weird combination where you've got primary progressive MS where you have a flare and continue to get worse at a steady rate. And every so often you have a severe extra flare on top of that. The three most common symptoms of MS are optic neuritis, brainstem symptoms, and then spinal cord symptoms. Optic neuritis is an inflammatory loss of vision based on inflammation of the optic nerve. Brainstem demyelination results in cranial nerve findings, so um, double vision, vertigo, facial numbness, but also spinal signs, except it's the pyramidal tracks within the brainstem that are being damaged. And then finally, spinal cord lesions. So you can get those in the cervical spine, thoracic spine, or lumbar spine, and it'll affect the arms or the legs respectively. And you should be aware of Lermit's sign, which is when you say do yoga or something and you uh, flex your neck down, you stretch the meninges, which are inflamed from those MS plaques,
and you get the sensation of electricity traveling down your back. This is a random clinical pearl that doesn't matter for the exam, but I just, I spent a week in the MS clinic, so it's cool to have an awareness of this syndrome, the antiphospholipid syndrome, which you should learn about um, at some point in your career. Uh, it's, it's like sort of a relatively common thing where people get recurrent clots. In terms of women's health, you get recurrent miscarriage because you get clots in the placenta. In terms of gen med and emergency, you get recurrent um, pulmonary embolisms. And in terms of neurology in general, you get recurrent strokes. So someone who clots a lot should be investigated for this syndrome because it can be managed with warfarin and aspirin quite easily, depending on whether they've had a clot or not. It looks a lot like MS on imaging if you've got lots of these clots because you get this periventricular intensity where the clots have happened because they're basically just like lots and lots of multi-territory embolic strokes. The difference is that ischemic changes happen almost instantly, but MS changes happen over days to weeks. So we met a lady in clinic who was going to be diagnosed with MS, but on revision of her history, she described that she was on the tram and out of nowhere, she just couldn't use her arm. And then another time, within minutes, she her leg went completely numb and then it got better. It was that piece alone that told us it wasn't MS, even though her MRI was consistent with MS and she was going to be diagnosed with MS. That time frame and eventually a positive antibody screen for antiphospholipid syndrome, it told us that what she actually had was an embolic condition rather than a demyelinating inflammatory condition. So it's kind of cool to know this stuff. Uh, other conditions to be aware of are neuromyelitis optica, which has the anti-aquaporin-4 antibodies, and that's an MCQ question that can come up. Clinically, it, it involves the spinal cord more so than MS, so you don't really get so many of the brainstem cranial nerve signs. You get more spinal cord involvement. Anti-MOG is another condition that looks like MS, and you just need to test for the anti-MOG antibody. And when you do all this stuff, if you test anti-aquaporin-4, anti-MOG, anti-phospholipid, um, the other condition that can look like MS is cerebral lupus. So if you do the anti-nuclear antibody and cardiolipin antibodies, uh, that can help for cerebral lupus. You do a brain and spinal cord MRI to detect the lesions, which will be um, hyper intense on uh, the T2 flare MRI, which shows you areas of sort of um, edema, and the lesions are periventricular in the periventricular white matter tracts. Gadolinium contrast will enhance any current inflammatory lesions because they show where blood vessels are leaky, uh, but all the old lesions will show up without contrast. So you don't essentially need to have contrast to make the diagnosis if the person's had multiple episodes. There are some other things like visual and auditory evoked potential testing and a lumbar puncture with oligoclonal bands, which can help, but it's kind of not really done anymore. The antibodies plus MRI are very specific when you've got a good history. The treatment of MS is very much like the treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. During a flare, you can use high-dose, uh, high-potency IV or oral steroids. And then in the long term, you use disease-modifying drugs, which modify how the immune system works. Fingolimod, for example, and Tysabri is a new antibody, natazulamab. It's basically the same idea as rheumatoid. The other thing they like to do is correct your vitamin D levels to about 120. That's given all this idea of vitamin D deficiency in MS. We don't know enough to say everyone should take vitamin D, but in people who have MS, there's decent evidence that says giving them vitamin D to a certain level can prevent them from getting worse at the normal rate that would be expected. So it's encouraged for everyone.
Let's talk about breast cancer. Um, if any of you know me from undergrad or early in medicine, you might know that if I did the physician training program, I would want to be an oncologist. It's kind of always been my thing since biomed. I just found the science of cancer interesting. So this section has quite a bit of detail, but I'll point out the stuff that's yield if you don't really like cancer that much. And to be honest, I'm probably going to do psychiatry anyway, so I can forget this stuff at some point, right? So the risk factors for breast cancer. Uh, female sex is more than male sex. BRCA mutations. First degree relatives. Age, older. Uh, no pregnancy or late pregnancy because that increases your estrogen exposure throughout life relative to someone that was pregnant multiple times, people that have taken certain preparations of HRT, um, and obesity when you're postmenopausal. Interestingly, obesity when you're premenopausal actually reduces your risk because it increases the chance that you'll have anovulatory cycles secondary to polycystic ovarians or just the, you know, uh, hormonal state of being obese, and so you'll actually produce less estrogen uh, compared to people that are ovulating. Uh, the types of breast cancer. So let's start first with the in situ tumors. So there's in situ and then there's invasive. Of the in situ tumors, which are limited by the basement membrane, there's a ductal and then a lobular. Ductal is the most common one we talk about. It's associated with calcification on mammography. There's this thing of comedo versus non-comedo. Don't worry about that. It basically just says whether or not there's a central necrotic core that makes it look kind of like a fried egg. And it's associated with this condition, Paget's disease of the nipple, where DCIS cells are in the lactiferous sinuses and cause this erythematous scaly eruption over the nipple, and that's quite concerning for cancer. It can also occur when it's invasive, it, it not just in situ. And then lobular, which is actually not associated with calcification and so very difficult to detect on mammography. And just to make sure you know what we're talking about, um, here's a milk duct on the bottom right and here's DCIS, the cells are within the duct but limited. And then there's invasive cancer, where it's still the ductal cells of origin, but they are invading into nearby tissues. And in the top left, you can see from the ducts, we have lobules. It's these lobular cells that give us the lobular carcinoma in situ. Types of breast cancer um, for invasive, the main one we care about is invasive ductal carcinoma, which is now known as no special type NST. It's characterized best by its hormone receptor status, which is uh, detected through immunohistochemistry and FISH for the HER2 level. The most common type is the estrogen progesterone positive HER2 negative cancer, also now known as luminal A. It's got the best prognosis and it's the most common. Next is a sort of unique mid type which has estrogen but not progesterone and still not HER2. That's luminal B. We then have another type that it has HER2 and it's called HER2 enriched and it can either have estrogen or not. The only thing that characterizes this one is that it's HER2 enriched. Finally, we have the triple negative best breast cancer, which is the basal type with the worst prognosis. So the best prognosis is luminal A with hormone receptors positive, but HER2 receptor negative. And the worst prognosis is when all three are negative. There are other types that aren't ductal carcinoma, like lobular, uh, but the main one to focus on is ductal carcinoma and have a good idea of these receptor subtypes and their relative prognosis. Another form to be aware of uh, 
which is kind of a version of ductal carcinoma, is this inflammatory breast cancer. It's when the carcinoma has dermal lymphatic invasion and you get podorange, erythema, skin plaques, and a growing breast mass. The, the breast itself will be tin, tender, burning, and there'll be bloody nipple discharge with axillary lymphadenopathy. Things to consider would be mastitis or a breast abscess or Paget's disease of the nipple. But if it is inflammatory breast cancer, having inflammatory breast cancer itself increases the stage of disease and it has a poorer prognosis. Clinical features of breast cancer include breast asymmetry because one breast has the mass growing in it. The palpable mass will typically be in the upper outer quadrant. It'll be non-tender and firm with poorly defined margins. Con contrast that with um, a lesion that might have uh, very well-defined margins. It's, you know, really easy to move within the skin and it doesn't hurt and it's kind of squishy. That might be a cyst rather than a tumour. Skin changes in the breast, like retractions and dimpling, which are secondary to calcification and tightening of Cooper's suspensory ligaments of the breast. Podorange appearance, which is secondary to breast edema from lymphatic obstruction by tumour cells. Nipple changes like inversion or blood tinged discharge. Axillary lymphadenopathy, which will be firm and painless lymph nodes because they're being invaded by tumour. Or you could have a reactive lymphadenopathy, in which case they would be a bit softer but more painful. And ulceration of the breast tissue. Uh, in the top there, we've got nipple inversion. The bottom left, we have breast dimpling and pode orange in the bottom right, orange peel appearance. Paget's disease of the nipple, you can see that it's a scaly erythematous lesion that kind of looks like psoriasis almost, or eczema, and it can be confused with nipple eczema, um, and it's associated with bleeding. The assessment of someone who has come in with a breast lump, uh, the non-suspicious features would be a young female with no family history, the mass is soft and movable, and the size changes with the menstrual cycle, suggesting it's fibrocystic disease and not a tumour. Things that raise your suspicion and your baseline risk would be a older age, positive family history, a firm mass with rigid borders or irregular borders, uh, skin changes, lymph nodes in the armpit, asymmetry, and if the mass is fixed or adhered to the skin or chest wall, suggesting it's a tumour that's invaded those tissues. The investigation, and here we're talking about diagnosis, you can do a diagnostic mammography, um, and you're looking for a mass or density that has poorly defined margins with speculated margins, especially, and clustered microcalcifications. On biopsy, you can either do an FNA or a core. If the pretest probability is low and you don't wanna you know, cause too much pain, say it's a young person and you're pretty sure this is a cyst, you could just do a fine needle aspirate. It would probably be good enough. But if there's a high chance that this could be cancer, you really need to do a core biopsy, which is a more involved procedure, and in some cases may require stereotactic techniques, because um, it's not just a little needle, it's a big core. And that will preserve the tissue architecture and be able to tell you whether the tumor has gone beyond the basement membrane to differentiate um, carcinoma in situ from invasive carcinoma. The workup, as um, I alluded to earlier, is FISH for HER2 levels and immunohistochemistry for the hormonal receptors. Tumor markers to test include CA15-3 and CA2729. One way of remembering CA15-3 from uh, the past medicine multi-choice question bank is if you turn the three on its side, it looks kind of like breast, so you can remember it's the marker for breast cancer. This isn't one that's tested in the Griffith exam so much. It's more those other tumor markers that you know of like AFP and um, CEA, etc. Uh, auxiliary node status, you can do a core needle biopsy. Um, 
or you might do the sentinel node procedure. We'll talk about that later. Bone scan for bone mets, and then you can do staging with a chest, abdo, pelvis, CT, thoracocentesis for pleural effusion fluid, or if you're in a wealthy you know, Gold Coast hospital, you can go straight to a PET scan and have a look at the whole body with a whole body PET CT. Surgical treatment for breast cancer these days, your options are wide local excision, mastectomy, which is removal of a whole breast. The other name for wide local excision is lumpectomy. Auxiliary surgery, which is either clearance or sentinel lymph node procedure. And if you combine wide local excision with sentinel lymph node procedure and adjuvant radiotherapy, it's got the same survival benefit as mastectomy, uh, but you get to preserve the appearance of the breast in terms of cosmesis, uh, and you get to avoid having issues with lymphatic drainage from the arm or at least you have less issues because less, less lymph nodes are going to be removed. The adjuvant treatment options are chemo, endocrine, a combination of the two. So in the hormonal positive cancers, luminal A and B, you can do chemo and endocrine, chemo and Herceptin if it's got HER2, or all three if it's triple positive. Here's one example of breast cancer treatment um, that's very commonly used, but you don't need to know this, okay? I just remember it because I did oncology this year and had to talk about it quite a lot. I'll talk about it here in case some of it sticks. The things that you should remember are the aromatase inhibitors and tamoxifen. Chemotherapy regimens aren't really something you're gonna get tested on because it's too complex. Anthracycline containing chemo, something like doxorubicin plus cyclophosphamide followed by paclitaxel is the standard chemo treatment for breast cancer. Chemo refers to those agents that are cytotoxic. Hormone treatment refers to things like tamoxifen and aromatase. And then there's another class which is small molecule inhibitors like the NIBs, which inhibit the like Janus kinase and CDK4 and 6 and stuff. And then you have your big antibodies, uh, which are the MABs, which you know, they things like Herceptin. So when someone says chemo, they mean stuff like doxorubicin, cyclophosphamide, gemcitabine, etc. Um, just be aware that basically all the drugs involved in breast cancer treatment can cause cardiomyopathy. So the doxorubicin and the Herceptin can both cause it. And so you should do echoes to um, screen for that. Tamoxifen is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, which inhibits estrogen in the breast, but promotes its activity in the liver, bone, uterus, and in terms of coagulation. In the uterus, it has an increased risk of endometrial hyperplasia, which can lead to endometrial cancer. So any postmenopausal woman with vaginal bleeding that has been on tamoxifen needs to be thoroughly investigated for uh, endometrial cancer. In terms of coagulation, you've got cancer, so that increases your DVT risk, and then tamoxifen itself increases your risk of DVT. Aromatase inhibitors are things like anastrozole. They block aromatase to prevent the peripheral conversion of testosterone into estrogen, um, or just any androgens into estrogen. And so they only work when you're postmenopausal because they only work on the peripheral aromatase, not the ovarian aromatase. Uh, tamoxifen, therefore, is used when you're um, premenopausal, and then aromatase inhibitors can be used when you're postmenopausal. Uh, trastuzumab or Herceptin is a monoclonal antibody against the HER2 receptor that's um, given for a year, basically. Um, long term, it can cause cardiotoxicity, which will require an echo. The conditions that you should have a rough idea of um, for third year, but for this year, you can just get away with um, breast cancer and maybe fibrocystic disease and fibroadenoma. Uh, but some that you should know for next year are mastitis, which is inflammation of the breast, breast abscess, which is uh, 
kind of a progression of mastitis sometimes that can be, you know, you can get an abscess forming in the nipple. Uh, fibrocystic disease, fibroadenoma, uh, and some nipple conditions are good to know. So in smokers, they can get mammary ductectasia, where they get this green purulent discharge from the nipple. So if someone has green nipple discharge, consider that diagnosis. And bloody nipple discharge, which can be a sign of cancer or Paget's disease of the nipple, but it can be this thing of intraductal papilloma, where you get kind of warts forming within the nipple and they're friable and so they break and bleed and you get blood in the nipple discharge. So just because someone has blood in their breast milk doesn't mean they have cancer. It's actually more likely to be this intraductal papilloma, which again can be biopsied and confirmed. Let's talk quickly about one of the most common complaints in general practice in neurology, headache. Primary headache, the three that you should know really well are migraine, tension, and cluster. Migraine is remembered by the acronym POUND, and uh, this wonderful neurologist I spent a week with, uh, his advice to me was learn this because if they have these, they have a migraine, and if they don't, they don't. So <laughs> it's really that easy to diagnose migraine disorder. The headache of migraine is pulsatile, so it's throbbing, it's one day of duration, uh, whereas other headaches will be shorter duration. It's unilateral typically, it's associated with nausea, and it's disabling. So if their headache is, you know, all over their head or behind the eyes, and it's been only for two hours every so often, it's not a migraine. Tension headache is the band or vice-like grip around your head, uh, and it lasts for 30 minutes up to even one week, but it isn't associated with nausea and vomiting, and it's not so disabling compared to migraine. And it's not really pulsatile, it's more of a constant pressure. Cluster headache is shorter, one to three hours, but they're recurring attacks. There's typically unilateral, and it's associated with pain around and behind the eye, and it's a burning or piercing sensation and you get autonomic symptoms with it, including <clears throat> redness of the eye, crying, runny nose, and even partial Horner's syndrome. So cluster headaches, the way to remember them is they're an autonomic headache. So they'll be ipsilateral with autonomic signs, especially to do with the eye. Don't get it confused with trigeminal neuralgia though, which is also to do with nerves. Secondary headaches, some of the red flag ones would be meningitis. Meningitis, you'll have fever, headache, and neck stiffness with photophobia and meningism, where you get quite irritated whenever you're stretching the meninges. Specific signs to elucidate uh, um, that would be Koenig's sign and Brudzinski's sign, which you should look up on YouTube. Um, I got given a really, really, really hard time on pediatrics because I didn't know what those were. Uh, that's just how third year goes. Don't worry about it. It says more about them than it does about you. Um, the other thing you should know for pediatrics is that if a baby's crying and as you're moving the baby, the crying gets worse, that could be meningism. You know, as you're shaking the baby to try calm them, gentle shaking, not intense shaking, uh, rocking we should say, if the crying and irritability gets worse, consider that it could be meningitis. Your threshold for these things in pediatrics is really low. It's like, you know, a kid has a fever and they're breathing funny, oh it could be sepsis. Uh, a kid is crying and they don't stop crying, oh it's either sepsis or meningitis. Boom, 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 let's go. Uh, just be aware of those things because that's how pediatrics operates. Brain bleeds, I'm sure you know about those. I'm sure you know the red flag of thunderclap headache or headache following a fall or trauma. Uh, giant cell arteritis is another one that you should really know about because it has a serious complication of blindness. 
in older people with a unilateral temporal headache and tenderness over the scalp or temporal artery associated with jaw claudication or even shoulder claudication, so they have difficulty hanging their washing, with visual abnormalities, consider giant cell arteritis. You can screen for this by testing their ESR sedimentation rate. Um, that's really helpful. Uh, but the best thing is to get a biopsy that's like a continuous long piece of temporal artery. And you're looking for this inflammatory process. It can be patchy. So that's why you need to get a big long piece of the artery. Because if you just get one little piece, you might get a false negative. Always consider brain tumours, and the reason that headaches comes up in P4P is because the lady with breast cancer, it metastasized to her brain, which led to a headache. So always think of um, tumours, whether they're primary or metastatic, as potentially causing headaches. They'll often be associated with seizure and focal neurological deficits. Trigeminal neuralgia and very important for GP land and clinical practice is medication overuse headache. Someone that takes Nurofen constantly for headache, the Nurofen is actually going to end up causing them a headache in the long term. And that's a really tricky thing to handle because they just become reliant on NSAIDs or paracetamol to terminate their headache. And that's the thing making everything worse. Uh, talking about intracranial space occupying lesions, so cerebral METs um, or primaries, around the tumour you get this vasogenic edema, so the tumour sort of inflames the blood vessels and makes them leaky. That causes swelling around the tumour which pushes on the brain. That swelling can lead to nausea, headache and focal neurological deficit. Uh, the edema can be reduced with dexamethasone, which is a really highly potent steroid. On the oncology ward, you'll see dexamethasone used for everything to do with um, tumor swelling, whether it's, you know, quarter equinus syndrome secondary to a tumor, superior vena carval obstruction secondary to a tumor, or a headache secondary to a tumor. Dexamethasone is your first point of call because it'll shrink the tumor down and take the pressure off of whatever organ. As a random note, which is so irrelevant at your level right now, but I'll just say it now because it might be something you remember. In the land of hematology, um, steroids can actually kill certain bloodborne cancers. So if you suspect a hematological malignancy, you need to um, test the blood and potentially get a you know, bone marrow biopsy or whatever before giving steroids because you might cause a false negative when they go looking for the hematological malignancy because the steroids have suppressed the cancer. Seizures can be common. Red flags, you should be aware of this um, other acronym, which is SNOOP-T. So there's a couple of S's and a couple of P's. S, systemic symptoms. If someone has a headache plus systemic features, that suggests it's you know something you should take kind of seriously. Most of the time it's just a viral infection though. Uh, but it could be a more serious infection. Uh, it could be an inflammatory process and it could be something like meningitis. Secondary risk factors, so things like HIV, cancer or immunosuppression. There's a very interesting article in the GP journal of someone that had a clinical picture that was so consistent with temporal arteritis. She was an old lady with visual changes. She had an elevated ESR. They never managed to get the biopsy. She was lost to follow up. Eventually they did get the biopsy of the temporal artery and it was negative. They went through all the motions and they just couldn't figure out what was going on. Finally, someone took a history properly and discovered she had breast cancer 10 years prior. They did an MRI and it was a brain met from recurrent breast cancer. That uh, article's you know, moral was to say, uh, taking a history is more important than any test you'll ever do. Because um, all the investigations and physical exam pointed so strongly towards one condition, but 
knowing the secondary risk factor of previous cancer would have made the GP at least think of ordering a CT scan or something, right? Yeah. Uh, neurological signs. So if someone has a headache and they're drowsy, that's scary. If they, you know, if they have a headache and they don't know where they are, you should start to suspect some kind of encephalitis process, an inflammation of the actual brain. The difference between encephalitis and meningitis is that meningitis just inflames the meninges, causes everything we talked about of, you know, the fever, headache, meningism, those physical signs, but it doesn't actually cause neurological deficits technically. Encephalitis is an inflammatory process of the brain tissue that actually causes neurological signs. There is a combined syndrome that's well recognized called meningoencephalitis. And that's when you just wanna, you know, go for both. But strictly speaking, neurological signs means encephalitis, no neurological signs, but all the same sort of symptoms is meningitis. Encephalitis could be inflammatory or infectious. Uh, the other thing to be aware of, obviously, would be a mass lesion. You know, if there was a tumor in the parietal lobe and then someone had contralateral motor weakness, it's because of the tumor. Strokes you should be aware of. You know, a really bad headache after a fall followed by uh, numbness and paralysis on the opposite side of their body should scare you that they're having a brain bleed, maybe a herniation secondary. Sudden onset headache is scary. It could be a bleed or it could be this thing called RCVS. I saw some of that on neurology where um, some people that had taken cocaine, it caused a sudden constriction of their blood vessels and they got a big ischemic stroke in their cerebellum um, or other areas of the brain I saw. It doesn't have to just be the posterior. Um, that is a terrifying condition because, you know, young people do cocaine and they can have permanent neurological deficit following that. Um, older people, so if they are over 50 and they've just got a new headache, that's concerning and it could be temporal arteritis. Positional headache is concerning, so it could be something to do with the pressures in the brain, intracranial hypotension, if, uh, you know, standing up makes the headache worse because the delivery of CSF in the brain has changed from the hypotension. If they have papilledema on uh, ophthalmoscopic examination, uh, that suggests intracranial hypertension, which could be secondary to either a tumor or a bleed or something else. Uh, interestingly, associated with intracranial hypertension is cranial nerve six deficits. You may remember that the obducens nerve has a long intracranial course that's it's quite exposed. So uh, when the pressure goes up and everything's getting swollen, obducens nerve palsies bilaterally point towards intracranial hypertension. If the headache is triggered by something, that's also scary. So Valsalva maneuver, exertion or sex, if that causes a headache, is concerning. There is a syndrome of headaches that are brought on by sex that is quite innocent though, but you can't just assume that. That's a diagnosis of exclusion. In terms of treatment, Panadol and NSAIDs are okay. Um, antiemetics can be useful for migraine nausea. Triptans are like a newer thing, but you should know them really well that they can terminate a migraine. Uh, but they're associated uh, in people that have ischemic heart disease with vasospasm and can actually worsen it. Um, and the only reason I know that is because we had a consult on neurology where um, this lady had had a heart attack in the past and they'd given her triptans and the neurologist said, what the hell? Uh, so I'll remember that forever now. Um, beta blockers, amitriptyline, blood pressure meds, epilepsy meds, especially Topamax, which is topiramate, um, they're all used as prophylaxis for migraine. Cystic fibrosis. It's an inherited disorder of iron transport that affects fluid secretion in exocrine glands in the lung, gut, and reproductive tissues. Normally in sweat ducts, 
through the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator protein, CFTR from here on out, chloride is sucked up from the sweat into the epithelial cells and sodium will follow. And that's one way that sweat concentration is regulated in terms of ions. In cystic fibrosis, because you can't reabsorb the chloride anymore because of CFTR mutation, the chloride stays in the sweat, and so then the sodium stays in the sweat because it's attracted to the negative charge of chloride. That's the opposite direction of what's happening in the airways in the gut. In the airways in the gut, chloride, uh, if we look at what normally happens, there's a balance of water being sucked from the muc uh, mucus back into the cells and chloride moving back into the mucus. Because of the chloride moving into the mucus, there's an equilibrium, which means that a certain amount of water stays in that mucus to keep it nice and thin. In cystic fibrosis, because no chloride moves out, a lot more water is sucked in and the mucus is dehydrated. So that may take a couple of times to click mentally, but basically the disordered movement of chloride results in very salty sweat and very thick mucus in the gut and lungs. Something to think about is that you've seen this protein back in first year, the CFTR, and it's actually the mechanism of how the cholera toxin works. The cholera toxin, through second me messenger signaling, causes constitutional activation of the CFTR to cause movement of chloride into the gut lumen and water follows and that causes the watery milky diarrhea of cholera. That's a free multi-choice question for you right there. Uh, you don't have to memorize this at all, but I'm just showing you that there's more than one type of cystic fibrosis depending on the mutations. So you can either have no protein, you can have protein but it doesn't get put into the membrane, you can have protein but it doesn't work, and there's multiple ways that it doesn't work. Depending on these, you can um, recognize why the modern drugs for cystic fibrosis only work for certain types of mutations. Because if you've just got no protein, then there's not much that can be done pharmacologically. But if you've got protein that's there but refuses to open, then maybe you could do a little bit more. Or if you've got a perfectly functioning protein but it's just not being put in the membrane, uh, that also you know, could be helped by pharmacology. Depending on how functional or dysfunctional the cystic fibrosis protein is um, working, you can go from, you know, a bit of lung issues and some sinus issues uh, with perhaps infertility from loss of the vas deferens to very severe lung disease, pancreas failure, meconium ileus at birth, and complete um, obstructive azoospermia infertility from having no vas deferens. So there's a lot of variation. The clinical features in terms of the lungs, uh, you'll have persistent infection because there's mucus in the lungs that can't be cleared, and you'll eventually get what's called bronchiectasis, which is a chronic inflammatory dilation of bronchioles associated with mucus uh, retention inside the lungs. It's a superative lung disease, and typically within that mucus, there'll be very nasty bacteria that can't be cleared uh, by normal uh, mucus secretion because the mucus is so thick. The bug that's most well known is Pseudomonas, and it's um, we uh, we used to use um, fluoroquinolones for UTI quite freely, um, but these days you need to be very careful with that because resistance to these drugs will eventually mean that there will be no effective treatment for Pseudomonas uh, and that would be a horrifying future. Chronic cough with sputum, um, chest radiograph features suggesting bronchiectasis and atelectasis, 
an, a obstructive airway pattern with wheeze and air trapping, nasal polyps, and finger clubbing. GI features can be broken up into the different areas. So in terms of the intestines, at birth, there may be meconium ileus, where the meconium is so thick from all the water reabsorption that the infant's or neonate's uh, bowels are obstructed and the meconium isn't passed when it normally should. Uh, rectal prolapse. If a you know pediatric case has rectal prolapse, uh, that should really concern you that this could be cystic fibrosis. It's it's a strong indicator, and we we had a case of that on pediatrics, and um, so try to remember that that you know rectal prolapse points towards CF. Pancreatic issues, uh, pancreatic insufficiency that can be exocrine or endocrine. Um, it begins as exocrine most typically, where you have loss of the you know pancreatic lipase amylase and the you know chymotrypsinogen and all that stuff that i've forgotten that do protein breakdown um, that can be tested with fecal elastase to see if the exocrine function is working failure of that exocrine function will result in diarrhea poor absorption of fat based nutrients like vitamin a d e k and failure to thrive it looks a lot like celiac. So in pediatrics, if you suspect uh, someone's having failure to thrive, you should consider CF and celiac. Recurrent pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis, which will increase your risk of pancreatic cancer later in life, and eventually endocrine pancreatic failure, which leads to a it's a very unique type of type 1 diabetes where you have insulin deficiency secondary to pancreatic failure. Liver issues, so biliary cirrhosis, cirrhosis of the liver and prolonged neonatal jaundice. Failure to thrive, as we said, and vitamin deficiency. And because all of that um, salt is being lost in the sweat, you can end up with uh, salt loss syndromes with um, hypovolemia, low blood pressure, and chronic metabolic alkalosis. The reason you get that is because when you're uh, salt depleted and your blood volume drops, your RAS system gets activated, you release aldosterone, and then aldosterone acts at the kidney to make you retain salt and excrete potassium and hydrogen. The excretion of hydrogen by, the, by aldosterone results in a chronic metabolic alkalosis because you'll always be salt deprived from sweating out salt, so you'll always have elevated aldosterone. Uh, for some reason, the CFTR receptor is involved in the congenital development of the male reproductive tract, especially the vas deferens connecting the epididymis to the ejaculatory tract. So you can have bilateral congenital absence of the vas deferens leading to obstructive azoospermia, and that leads to infertility. Interestingly, though, you can pass a needle directly into the epididymis, take some sperm out of there, and through artificial insemination, you can then have a baby, even though you don't have a vas deferens. Um, you could also do... Uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis if you wanted to check whether or not your child would have cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis screening. Uh, so newborns, all newborns get screened and that heel prick blood test that goes onto a little cardboard card, that one of those squares, there's four of them, um, may as well just say the for now in case it sticks in your head and there's a DHC multi-choice. So one of them tests for TSH to detect thyroid issues that are congenital thyroid issues. One of them tests for immunoreactive trypsin, which is um, what the cystic fibrosis screen is. One of them tests for phenylketonuria, which is a metabolic issue which can be fatal if you consume phenylalanine or other amino acids. And finally, there's one big metabolic panel which goes to a mass spectrometer 
um, and it detects like 23 different inborn errors of metabolism, including um, issues to do with certain carbohydrate metabolism. So there's a little bit of revision outside of DKHI for you, but the heel prick test for cystic fibrosis is testing for immunoreactive trypsin. People with cystic fibrosis have, have uh, fibrosis have pancreatic obstruction, and so trypsin from the pancreas leaks out into the blood because of that obstruction, and then that is uh, tested in this heel prick test, and some of those will be false positive. So they take a certain predefined proportion of the positive heel prick tests, and they then go on to refer a certain number of those for all the babies born that week for sweat testing. The sweat test is a diagnostic test. So the heel prick is screening, but the sweat test is diagnostic. They pass a electrical current through the skin with pilocarpine, which is a muscarinic agonist, to induce sweating in the baby. And then they test that sweat for chloride. And if there's a elevation above a certain threshold, that confirms the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. Remember that the dysfunctional CFTR means that people with CF have high levels of chloride in their sweat. Treatment, the most important treatment is respiratory physiotherapy and aerosolized mucolytics. Um, one of those is Dornase Alpha, which uh, in the lungs with this bronchiectasis and chronic infection, neutrophils explode in what's called netosis, uh, neutrophil extracellular trap osis. Uh, and that trap has lots of DNA in it. And the Dornase Alpha is a DNA's enzyme preparation, which will cleave that DNA up, which helps to reduce the thickness of the mucus. Hypertonic saline helps to suck water back into the mucus, and so does mannitol. Now, these days, we have some new therapies on the PBS, depending on what your mutation is. If you've got the uh, Delta 508 mutation, uh, you and that's the most common mutation, you can try out this therapy of Lumacaftor, Tezacaftor. And these agents, um, which they're the same thing, just Tezacaftor is like a newer generic of Lumacaftor, they uh, help out with the proper folding and trafficking of the CFTR into the surface of the cell. So remember, some types of CF, depending on the mutation, they do produce the protein, it's just it doesn't make it into the cell membrane. Well, these drugs help to put it into the membrane, and that's why they're called corrector therapy. Ivacaftor is a potentiator, which in people with the 551D mutation, which is 8% in Australia, they have the protein in their membrane, but it doesn't like to open very much. This drug makes that protein open more often and stay open for longer. So therefore, it only works if you actually have the protein in the membrane and have this specific mutation. Something kind of interesting about the CF case was this discussion of pharmacokinetics dependent on body composition. This is relevant for cystic fibrosis and also prescribing in the elderly. I remind you of volume of distribution, which you saw at the very beginning of ISM in first year, where Jeff did a lecture on fluid balance. The volume of distribution refers to the total amount of drug that was put into the body, divided by the plasma concentration of that drug. It basically describes a theoretical plasma volume, which you would need to contain 100% of whatever drug went in. That might not mean anything, but a simple way to sort of understand it is that you've only got six litres of blood. So if the volume of distribution is any bigger than six litres, that tells you all six litres of your blood is filled with drug, and whatever extra volume of distribution must be somewhere else in the body, whether it's in your muscles or your fat. So, for example, if the volume of distribution was 20 litres, then 
all six litres of your blood is filled with drug, and an extra 14 litres worth of blood is also filled with drug. Now obviously you don't have 14 litres of extra blood, but what you do have is your muscles and fat. If a drug is really fat soluble, uh, it'll have a massive volume of distribution because it'll dissolve into all your fat as well as that six litre blood volume. If a drug is very, very, very water soluble or it's highly um, bound to albumin in the blood, the plasma volume will be much smaller and it will reflect the actual quantity of blood in your body. Don't worry if you don't understand that. Maybe just memorize it before the test or something. In cystic fibrosis, if we had two children that were both 50 kilograms, for example, the kid with CF, because of their issues with their gut and malabsorption, they will have more muscle mass compared to an average child. That's not because they're stronger, it's because they have less fat, because they're, you know, chronically malnourished, they don't have much fat on them. So if that child was compared to a child of the same weight, their lean mass to fat mass ratio would be in favour of lean mass because there's just not much fat around. That has implications because it means that the volume of distribution of a drug would be different in someone with cystic fibrosis, even though they weigh the same amount as another child. So drugs are typically dosed per kilogram for children. So like, for example, um, gentamicin is in someone really sick, five milligrams per kilogram of body mass. If a cystic fibrosis child was 30 kilograms, and a non-CF child was also 30 kilograms, and you calculated the gentamicin dose to be 150 milligrams, five times 30, it would have a different volume of distribution in the cystic fibrosis child compared to the non-cystic fibrosis child. Why? Because the cystic fibrosis child, their body is composed of different stuff compared to the non-CF child. Their body is made of more muscle, and muscle is very watery because of the glycogen in your muscle, whereas fat is hydrophobic. It doesn't dissolve water very well. If gentamicin is a water-soluble drug, the cystic fibrosis child will dissolve a little bit more of that drug into their muscle, so the volume of distribution will be greater for that water-soluble drug compared to the child who has relatively more fat because the gentamicin doesn't go into the fat and because they're the same weight and they've got more fat, they have to have less muscle. So there's less muscle to soak up the gentamicin. This might be very, 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 very complicated, but basically in kids with cystic fibrosis, for a water-soluble drug, the volume of distribution is greater, and so to achieve a therapeutic concentration in the actual plasma, you need a higher dose of drug, because you need to fill that greater volume of distribution before the concentration will be achieved in the blood. Hopefully that makes sense. Maybe revisit this topic a couple of times. At most, it would be one multi-choice, and it would be a hard one at that. So putting that simply, if you're prescribing a water-soluble drug to someone with lots of muscle, you need a bigger dose because that drug will be soaked up in their watery muscles. Cystic fibrosis patients have more muscle compared to a non-CF patient of the same weight, so they need a higher dose of a water-soluble drug. And the opposite of that, they need a lower dose of a fat-soluble drug because they barely have any fat, there's not that much fat to soak up the drugs, so a lot of it goes immediately into the plasma. The opposite condition is true, where a fat-soluble drug, like a steroid, to someone who has more fat on their body, you need a bigger dose, because it will be absorbed by their fat.
in older patients, they lose their muscle mass. And so per kilogram, it's the opposite of cystic fibrosis. They have less muscle mass and more fat mass. So in elderly patients, for water-soluble drugs, you need a lower dose. And uh, for fat-soluble drugs, you need a higher dose. I hope this makes some sense. Let's go rapid fire through burns. Locally, a burn, um, an eschar or eschar, can cause constriction. That's really significant if it's on the chest because you won't be able to breathe, or if it's on the abdomen, it can cause abdominal compartment syndrome, and both of those are very, very bad. Compartment syndrome on a limb is also very, very bad. So you may have to uh, surgically perform an escherotomy to cut it open to relieve any pressure that's building under that constricted tissue. Systemically though, when you've got either a large burn or a deep burn, you have an inflammatory reaction to that burn that becomes a systemic inflammatory response. You have leaky blood vessels in response to that inflammation and they leak out albumin and fluid which results in severe volume depletion, edema, and acute respiratory distress because that fluid will leak out into the lungs, causing pulmonary edema and pleural effusion. The inflammatory mediators will activate the coagulation cascade, and you'll go into disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. You'll have lots of clots forming everywhere in your little blood vessels. And that's bad because it depletes your platelets. So then that means you can bleed from anywhere else because you don't have any platelets anymore. It also means that your blood vessels, as they try to squeeze through your blood vessels, will be torn apart by the clot. That's generally called microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. That hemolytic process itself is really bad because hemolysis is, you know, it leads to anemia and the hemoglobin uh, goes and damages your kidney and that's not good if you're also suffering a burn. The loss of the skin barrier can result in evaporative fluid loss, which leads to severe dehydration. It also results in heat loss. The skin is a, per, you know, a really good insulator for heat, so you'll get hypothermia. In the long term, Following this severe inflammatory reaction, you'll have severe immunosuppression. So you can have commensal lung bacteria suddenly turn into a severe pneumonia, for example, and get sepsis. Uh, and the acute kidney injury following hemolysis, as we said. If you breathe in this superheated air in a fire, that can damage the airways, which at first might be okay, but eventually it'll all swell up and you won't be able to breathe and they won't be able to intubate you because your larynx is too swollen to pass the tube through the cords. Uh, so when you come into ED following a burn, they need to have a look in your nose and mouth to see if there's any soot or if you know your moustache hairs appear singed, any ash around the nose or mouth, uh, because that's a priority to get um, and intubation happening if there's any initial signs of inhalation injury. Just a reminder of the layers of the skin, epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous tissue, or hypodermis. The burns are broken up anatomically in that way. So uh, we used to use first, second, third, and fourth degree, but now we use what's in brackets here. So a superficial burn is the epidermis. A superficial partial or a deep partial are the dermis, where the uh, superficial partial is the top layer of the dermis and the deep partial is the bottom layer of the dermis. And then a full thickness burn is all the way down into the hypodermis. And then I, you know, I think fourth degree burn has kind of been combined with that that it's when you've burnt all the way basically down to the bone or the you know muscle or whatever. Clinically, uh, the superficial burn will have redness, but it won't really form vesicles and bullae. If they're forming vesicles and bullae, 
That suggests that the burn must be in the dermis because the edema of the dermis causes fluid to extravasate and it gets coated by the epidermis and that's what the vesicle actually is. So the burn must be deeper than just the epidermis. So that's why a superficial burn doesn't really blister. The difference between the superficial partial thickness and the deep partial thickness is that, you know, both of them get vesicles, but the superficial burn, it blanches. So when you push down on the skin, it'll turn white. And then the, uh, as the capillaries refill, it will turn skin colored again or red. The deep partial thickness burn, uh, you know, it has the vesicles as well, but it doesn't blanch when you push down on it. And then finally, the difference between all of those in the full thickness burn is that because of damage to the neurological tissue, there's no pain. It's a painless burn. It's so deep that it doesn't hurt. So just to put that in a simple algorithm, all burns will be red. Uh, you know, they may be black if they're very, very deep, but, you know, simply put, they're painful and red for the top three. The difference between the superficial and the partial thickness versus a full thickness is that full thickness has no pain. The difference between superficial and partial thickness is that partial thickness gets vesicles. And then within the partial thickness, the difference between superficial and deep is whether or not it blanches. So just one last time, superficial burns, they hurt, they blanch, but they don't have vesicles. Superficial partial, they hurt, they blanch, and they have vesicles. Deep partial, they hurt, they have vesicles, but they don't blanch, and full thickness doesn't hurt doesn't blanch. The rule of nines is really high yield, so you break up the body and, and you know, you'll just have to draw this on a piece of paper a couple of times to remember it. Honestly, I've forgotten it since the exam, but it will come up on the exam. They'll tell you where the burns are. You'll need to use the rule of nines in your head to figure out the body surface area that's been burned and then use the Parkland's formula to figure out how much fluid they'll need. So 9% for the head, 9% for the front of the trunk, 9% for the arms, 9% for the thighs and legs, 9% for the abdomen, and then 9% for the top of the back and 9% for the bottom of the back. There's other ways you could divide that, but basically what you need to mentally know is that there's 11 nines, right? Because nine times 11 is 99, and then the 1% is the genitals. So you might get confused and, you know, you'll label the whole trunk as 9%, but then when you go up to add it all up, you'll be missing one lot of 9%. So you'll go, oh, yeah, it's meant to be 9 on top and 9 on bottom. Or you might forget to do the back and whatever. Just remember that there's got to be 11 lots of 9 plus 1% on the genitals. There's, uh, you know, similar rules for infants and toddlers and adolescents, but the high yield is the adult one. If they do an infant, that's, you know, you'll just get that question wrong. Who cares? When do you need to refer them to a tertiary burns unit? So Gold Coast Hospital doesn't have a tertiary burns unit. You'd have to send them up to Brisbane. Uh, if the burns are greater than 10%, so that could be, for example, um, an entire arm plus some of the chest, that would be too much to handle at a normal ED. That needs to go. Burns to any sensitive area. So, you know, your hands, your feet, your face, your genitals, that needs to go. Uh, if it's a full thickness burn greater than 5%, so if it's gone all the way down and, you know, it's just half your arm, that's still too much. Anything that's electrical, chemical or radiation, that needs to go. So it's only, you know, temperature burns from, you know, hot fluids or fire that can be handled at an ED. If it's electrical, chemical or radiation, you need a specialist. Um, any inhalation injury needs to be intubated and then sent off to the burns unit. Uh, and, you know, young or old or a burn that's not healing needs to be referred.
How do you manage it, though, if, if you aren't at a burns unit, but you're the first responder or whatever? Cool it actively with running tap water for 20 minutes, up to a maximum of an hour. Don't use freezing cold water, just, just you know, cool water from a tap. Don't let them get too cold, so wrap their body up in some kind of blanket, but the area that's burned, cool it. So paramedics say, cool the burn, warm the patient. Airway management, assess for inhalation injury, intubate if needed. Um, it may become impossible when you have laryngeal edema. This is kind of like A, B, C, D. So A and B is the, you know, assess the airway and intubate. C, circulation, so fluid resus. The traditional Parkland formula, which was on my exam, I don't know if they're going to use the new one, but let's just talk about the traditional one for now. You need to memorize this. It's four mils times the body surface area burned times their weight. That will give you a number of milliliters, which you give across 24 hours where the first half is given in the first eight hours and the second half is given slower over the next 16 hours. So let's say, for example, it's a 100 kilogram person with 9% uh, of their body, body surface area burned. That would be 36 mils times 100 kilos 3,600 mils to be given in 24 hours. Divide it in half, so that's 1,800 mils in the first eight hours, and then the next 1,800 mils to be given in the next 16 hours. And you could calculate how many mils per hour you would need, you know, to do that. And then you need to put in an indwelling catheter to monitor their urine output and titrate the fluid rate to achieve a urine output of 0.5 mils per kilogram per hour. So for our 100 kilogram person, for every hour, we would want to see 50 mils. I said that slow because I couldn't figure out how to do math in my head for a second there. So that's the fluids, right? Four mils times the body surface area in 24 hours per kilogram first half in eight, the next half in 16. Uh, the IDC and the urine output, 0.5 mils per kilo per hour is just the standard urine output of a healthy person, so that's a good number to remember in the future for surgery. Um, people might need additional maintenance fluid, right? Because this Parkland formula is just to give you the amount to fluid resuscitate someone who's been burned. If they're also nil by mouth, you need to chart the additional, you know, one to two liters of fluid that people would normally drink in a 24 hour period. But the new recommendation from the American Burn Association is to take whatever you used to do and give half. So it's still the same eight hours, 16 hours thing, but it's half. So for our guy, uh, you know, we calculated 3,600 mils of water, or not water, but um, Hartman's solution is the fluid of choice here, uh, also known as Ringer's lactate. We would give 1,800 so 900 mils in the first eight hours, followed by 900 mils in the next 16 hours. And we would slowly increase it if the urine output of 0.5 mils per kilo per hour wasn't being achieved. The reason for this is that they have noticed that using the traditional Parkland's formula, they've actually been getting lots of pleural effusions, compartment syndromes, heart failure, signs that too much fluid is being pumped into the body. So this is a rapidly evolving space. See how you go. I mean, my exam, we used the four um, traditional Parkland's formula. If you go on MDCalc, the app that most doctors use for this stuff, because they don't remember any of it by the time they're doctors, and some of them weren't even taught it, who cares? Um, that still just uses the standard formula, and it makes no mention of this new recommendation. This is just from Amboss. So.
take it with a grain of salt. Additional things to do. The person's skin barrier has been exposed. They might have been exposed to dirt and nasty stuff. Let's give them tetanus prophylaxis. Uh, they're likely in the worst pain that they'll ever feel in their life. Let's give them, you know, heavy opioids and, you know, potentially even have to sedate them in ICU. Let's give them PPIs to prevent curling's ulcers. So curling's ulcers are secondary to the shock. You have reduced blood flow to the stomach and the stomach becomes ischemic and that's one of the things that will lead to ulcers in the stomach. Antiseptic ointments are an option, so sulfur sulfadiazine I've seen used on burns. Um, silver, sorry. Uh, dressing the wound can be an option and there's certain dressings and this one here, it's like a flexible sort of absorbent dressing that keeps the wound nice and moist. Um, so unlike normal wounds where you don't want them to get too moist, moist um, burns, you don't want the skin to dry out too much. So this is a sort of balance with a little bit of gel in the uh, thing to keep it cool and, and uh, stop it from drying out. Necrotic tissue needs to be cut away soon because very nasty bacteria will grow within that necrotic tissue and lead to sepsis. And escherotomy is an option. Uh, this is the Royal Children's Hospital Burns uh, guideline here that I've linked and, and that's really helpful if you want to learn more. Let's really quickly talk about aging and pharmacology. We kind of alluded to it during the cystic fibrosis section that, you know, volume of distribution changes with age and uh, some other things change with age. So the first pass metabolism, which is the SIP enzymes in the liver doing their thing, uh, that gets reduced with age. It's partially because of the liver shrinking, but also the actual blood flow to the liver gets reduced. So drugs that um, are normally degraded by the liver upon first ingestion, they become more active and drugs that are pro-drugs that need to be activated in the liver, like uh, quite a few of the ACE inhibitors, they will be less active because they're not being activated by the liver. Uh, so for example, uh, endone needs to be metabolized into two lots of morphine by the liver. And someone with an old liver won't be able to do that activation so well. Um, so for example, codeine and endone, which is oxycodone, they both um, are pro-drugs that they don't actually exert most of the analgesic effect. They need to be converted into their metabolites by the liver to have effective analgesic properties. Uh, drug distribution changes. As we said, the volume of distribution uh, for Lipid-soluble drugs will be increased, but water-soluble drugs will be decreased because there's less water-soluble stuff in the person. There's less muscle, right? So gentamicin, digoxin, alcohol, they all need to have their dose reduced because there will be a higher plasma concentration for the same dose of drug per kilogram of body mass because there's less muscle in that body mass, which would normally soak up some of the drug. Drug clearance gets reduced, so you know, in, as the GFR drops, many water-soluble drugs will need their dose to be reduced. Um, so for example, insulin needs to be reduced. You can have an insulin overdose because the kidney needs to excrete insulin, and that's an MCQ that I've seen before. Also, hepatic clearance of some drugs is reduced. Uh, these are some principles of prescribing in elderly people from the AMH Aged Care Companion. I recommend you just make yourself familiar with this book. It's quite helpful. Basically, don't use drugs if you can avoid them. Use the lowest number of drugs possible. Polypharmacy is really bad. Use a low dose and increase it slowly. Start low, go slow. Use the lowest dose as possible when you do figure out the good dose. Um, and constantly consider, you know, is this going to make the person's life worse? Is it worth giving to the person? What is the risk of overdose? You know, just because this person has a high chads fast score doesn't mean we should give them warfarin because they're very likely to fall and I don't want them to die of a brain bleed before their atrial fibrillation would even possibly consider causing them a stroke.
If you don't know what that stuff is, um, go view the systems lecture where I talk about atrial fibrillation and anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation. You probably should have a little idea about that. The acute surgical abdomen is something I just wanted to throw in. It was a like weird clinical vignette thing that we did for clinical skills. I think each year they do a different case, so yours might be different, uh, but I just think it's good to revise. Um, surgically, you can divide the abdomen into quadrants, which is very helpful. Uh, then you can also consider some region-specific things. So let's start with the right upper quadrant. Anatomically, there is a liver here, a gallbladder, a diaphragm sitting on top, and uh, a lung that sits on top of that diaphragm. And posteriorly, there is a kidney, and there is a ureter traveling down. So that's why there's this list of possible causes of pain in the top right of your abdomen. It's either acute hepatitis, or more commonly, it's gallstones or cholecystitis or cholecystitis, all things that you will learn um, better during surgery. Um, or it's a kidney, or it's a lower lobe pneumonia, which has irritated the diaphragm, which has made your white, right upper quadrant hurt. Something to note, whenever the diaphragm is irritated, because it's innervated by C345, and because C4 innervates the tip of your shoulder, people with uh, diaphragm pain, either from liver or from lower lobe pneumonia, the pain often refers to their shoulder tip. And I actually saw this in a gentleman that had um, cancer in his liver. The left upper quadrant has your stomach, um, and again, the same things that the right side had that aren't the liver and the gallbladder. So stomach ulcers. The epigastric region right in the middle is directly below the heart and has the pancreas. So things to consider there that are unique would be pancreatitis and myocardial infarction. The lower abdomen, uh, again, there's some things that are mirrored here. So Gynecologically, you could have ovarian torsion or testicular torsion or pelvic inflammatory disease or ectopic pregnancy or, you know, whatever things that you'll learn better during women's health. And for men's health, you'll just Google it when you're a GP or whatever, I guess, because you won't get taught it. Uh, then you've got the bowel things. If it's on the right, it's most likely appendicitis. If it's on the left, it's most likely diverticulitis. And that's why diverticulitis is colloquially known as left-sided appendicitis, because diverticulitis typically affects the sigmoid colon, whereas appendicitis affects the appendix, which is on the right next to the cecum. Hernias can occur on both sides. Inflammatory bowel disease can hurt you on both sides. And urinary tract infection can hurt you on both sides and ureteric colic. So that's sort of, you know, as long as you know the anatomy, you can make a really good guess as to what could be hurting using this quadrant method. You must also consider um, for periumbilical pain, which isn't on this list, uh, the one I'm thinking of, but um, urinary tract infection tends to be periumbilical tenderness because that's where the bladder sits and if you've got cystitis, the blood is inflamed, and as you palpate periumbilically, it will hurt. Some clinical things that might just be fun to know, um, but essential to know later on, is uh, when the peritoneum is inflamed, you get rebound tenderness, as you've learned from your GIT exam. But when you percuss the abdomen, if it's tender, you'll actually get percussion tenderness. Uh, if, if there is peritonitis, or as you put your stethoscope on their abdomen, that will cause rebound tenderness. You don't actually have to dig your fingers in and let go to prove that someone has appendicitis. You can just put your stethoscope over their appendix and they will scream in pain because that peritoneum is really upset. 
Some things that would be worth looking up for appendicitis is psoas sign, obturator sign, hamburger sign, and Rovsing sign, which is when you palpate the left lower quadrant, they get pain in the right lower quadrant because as you pull down on the left, you stretch the peritoneum over the inflamed appendix. This is all probably irrelevant for your exams, but it's just some stuff that I've picked up over the year. Just wanted to put it here because, you know, pain in the tummy is a very common emergency room complaint. It's actually the first thing that I really saw because I started the year on pediatrics ED. I walked in there and there was a kid with appendicitis and that's the first history that I took um, in that year. Um, you know, surgery is all about you know, bowel pain or uh, gallbladder pain, so, or appendicitis, it, you know, it's stuff that is really good to know. Well done on making it this far throughout the lecture. This final section is going to focus on fertility, reproduction, and women's health. So let's just get into it. Infertility. From up to date, this is a population-based study that looked at some of the most common causes of infertility. Male factor is relevant in a quarter of cases, and that's a collective summary of hypogonadism, which is the endocrine dysfunction, blockages that are after the testes, um, seminiferous tubule issues, and in cystic fibrosis, absence of the vas deferens. You can't actually get the sperm out, obstructive azoospermia. The next thing to consider is ovulatory dysfunction, which is, you know, the most common uh, in women besides the unexplained. Um, and that's typically endocrine issues like polycystic ovarian syndrome, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, hypothyroidism, Cushing's, etc. Tubal damage. So following a chlamydia infection, you can get inflammation of the fallopian tubes. And if you have pelvic inflammatory disease, you'll get adhesions and scarring of the tubes, which mean that you can't um, properly fertilize the ovum. And that's one cause of infertility. Endometriosis is another cause, again, for similar reasons of scarring of the tubes and things like that. Uh, coital problems is uh, who knows what that means. I'm sure that encompasses a wide area of sexual health medicine. Cervical factors, um, that's relevant. Another interesting one is uh, some women can actually have uh, immune reactions to um, sperm antigens. That's called the anti-sperm antigen antibody. Um, and in those people, it's actually an immune reaction that prevents fertilization. That's really rare, though. It's just interesting. Uh, and then unexplained is quite common. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is something you should know very, 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 very well for your exam. This diagram is kind of complex, but basically for some reason, typically to do with, you know, obesity, there is a imbalance between the LH to FSH ratio where there's more LH. This is accompanied by insulin resistance. The increased amount of LH forces theca cells to produce androgens, but without FSH, those androgens don't get aromatized to estrogen. So you're in a state of hyperandrogenism. That increased level of androgen disrupts the menstrual cycle, and so you have anovulatory cycles. You form these polycystic ovaries because you never ovulate them, you just get big follicles. But they're nothing to do with the disease. They're just a uh, sort of symptom of the underlying pathology, which is the imbalance of LH to FSH from the pituitary. The androgens lead to hyperandrogenism, which is leads to hirsutism, skin thickening, acne, uh, and, and the irregular menstruation. So putting all of that together, if you're not ovulating, you'll have heavy periods. We talked about that before during the thyroid component that um, without ovulation, you just have the follicular phase on the endometrium and it grows thicker and thicker and thicker until it finally outstrips its own blood supply and you bleed. 
but it's not really like your proper period because there was never a luteal secretory phase of the endometrium because there was never any progesterone because you didn't ovulate. The, uh, th that's the same thing that will happen here because you're not ovulating. Uh, and because you're not ovulating, you can't get pregnant. The treatment is metformin because it improves insulin resistance which can reverse this LH to FSH uh, imbalance, which will restore the, you know, aromatization of androgens or, or at least reduce the androgens so that your baseline aromatization can keep up. That will reduce the hyperandrogenism, restore the menstrual cycle and hopefully restore fertility. Here's, um, yeah, so metformin's indication for PCOS and the two cell two gonadotropin hypothesis that LH, which is a gonadotropin, goes to a theca cell, makes androgen, and then FSH tells that androgen to be aromatized to estrogen in the granulosa cell. If you've got too much LH and not enough FSH, you'll do the first half of this picture, but not the second half, and so you'll have too many androgens and not enough estrogen. Ovulatory dysfunction um, is, is any condition that leads to anovulation. So thyroid, congenital adrenal, PCOS, Cushing's, anorexia directly, you know, any stress on the hypothalamus will turn off your menstrual cycle and so you'll no longer ovulate, including iron deficiency anemia. Let's talk a little bit about the techniques of artificial insemination. In vitro fertilization, uh, made very, very simple, you give the person FSH in order to stimulate the growth of follicles. You prevent ovulation by either giving a GnRH agonist or antagonist, either one will disrupt the normal cycle and so you won't get your LH surge. You then grow that mature cohort of follicles with the FSH and it won't be ovulated because the GnRH um, drug is blocking natural ovulation. And then when it's big enough and there's enough follicles there, you give HCG, which is an analog of luteinizing hormone, that will stimulate super ovulation. And those eggs will be free floating you know, around the ovary. And then transvaginally by ultrasound, you do needle aspiration to soak up some fluid, and within that fluid, there will be those super ovulated eggs, hopefully. You can then take those, put them in a petri dish and mix them with sperm, and hopefully they will fertilize in that culture medium. And if there's problems with the sperm, you can actually do ICSI, which is intracytoplasmic sperm injection. You can take the oocyte, and directly inject a spermatozoa into the oocyte. That has no benefit to just normal IVF if there isn't any male factor in the infertility. The sperm could be from a fresh ejaculate or, um, as we alluded to in CF, they could be harvested directly from the epididymis via percutaneous needle uh, so that people who don't have a vas deferens or have other forms of obstructed azoospermia can have babies. Um, these are just slides from an old DLAP lecture from Malcolm, who's not um, in the school anymore, but I'm borrowing them uh, for the sake of helping you. So I hope he is okay with that wherever he is working these days. Um, it's just definitions of what we talked about. Cryopreservation, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, so when you do IVF, you don't necessarily do this PGD. Um, but if you are doing IVF because you want to avoid passing on a genetic condition to your children, that means you're eligible. If it's an X-linked condition, you can do sex selection and make sure that the kid won't get it. Um, or if it's another condition that's you know, within the realm of ethics, you can um, just do genetic diagnosis before implanting that gamete, uh, because you'll have a whole bunch of embryos, right? So you can pick one. And so you may as well use genetic diagnosis to pick the one that 
is going to, you know, not have cystic fibrosis or whatever condition you were hoping to not have. Obviously, legally and ethically, this is that whole thing of, you know, designing babies and whatever, but that's just not relevant at this stage. Here's how that super ovulation and um, transvaginal needle aspiration occurs. It probably hurts. Menopause. Um, just wanted to add this in because there's sometimes multi-choice questions about it. It's diagnosed after a year without a period. There's a primary reduction in ovarian function leading to a reduce in um, your sex hormones. So then you no longer have a negative feedback on LH and FSH, which means if you do a blood test, you'll have high levels of FSH. That's one thing that helps to sort of confirm the diagnosis of menopause, but a year without period is, is enough to diagnose it in, in the right age group. You'll have uh, anovulation, eventually follicular depletion, and then permanent cessation of ovarian function. Uh, irregular periods, sweating, hot flush, heat intolerance, sleep issues, mood issues, libido, not libido, um, and vulvovaginal atrophy, which can be symptomatically managed with an estrogen pessary if wishing. That doesn't have so many issues with breast cancer as systemic hormonal replacement therapy does. Let's do a big summary of obstetrics and gynecology because it's relevant for P4P, but also I want to give you a little bit of extra just to make third year not be so overwhelming. Let's do our best to summarize things. Um, I've tried to give a broad sort of overview of things. Um, I've actually removed a couple of topics at the end on PID and tubo ovarian abscess because it's just, it's just too much, but let's do our best. Dysmenorrhea, painful menstruation. It can be primary or secondary. Primary dysmenorrhea occurs when there's an imbalance of prostaglandin synthesis in the endometrium, leading to spasmic dysmenorrhea. The synthesis is triggered by progesterone interacting with the endometrium. Because prostaglandins are produced by cyclooxygenase enzymes, it can be treated with NSAIDs. So if you take NSAIDs a couple of days before when you're ex expecting your period, it will significantly reduce the dysmenorrhea. Paracetamol won't help. It needs to be an NSAID. It needs to be ibuprofen or something like meloxicam. If you go on the OCP, then there's no ovulation, there's no secretory phase on the endometrium, and that means there's no prostaglandins produced. So you will also um, effectively prevent the primary dysmenorrhea. Secondary dysmenorrhea is when it's secondary to a medical condition like endometriosis or pelvic inflammatory disease. I want to note here that endometriosis doesn't cause heavy periods the endometriosis is not inside the uterus, but endometriosis can cause dysmenorrhea, pain during period. Heavy periods is not attributable at all to endometriosis. You'll be surprised how often you hear that in society. They'll say, oh, you've got endometriosis. Do you have a heavy, heavy period? It's not to do with the endometriosis. You should go look for a different cause. But the treatment for endometriosis is also the OCP, which is also the treatment for heavy periods a lot of the time. So I guess it doesn't matter too much to make that differentiation, but people that care about endometriosis will care about making that differentiation. Anyway, abnormal uterine bleeding. Uh, the causes of menorrhagia are remembered by the acronym PALM for surgical and COIN for medical. Palm is polyps, adenomyosis, which is like endometriosis, but it's just invading the actual uterine layers. Leomyoma, which is uh, the same thing as a fibroid, but it has to be pedunculated or submucosal to cause bleeding. If it's a fibroid, like on the outside of the uterus, you know, hanging out over the edge of it, that's not causing the bleeding. So, you know, the issue becomes in someone with postmenopausal bleeding, you might find a fibroid and then say, oh, that's the cause. We don't need to look further for cancer. But if that fibroid isn't submucosal, 
it, it's not causing that bleeding. Okay, so you need to keep looking for endometrial cancer. Um, M for malignancy, so endometrial, cervical, vaginal, vulval, anything can cause abnormal bleeding. And then medically, coagulopathy, ovulatory disorder, so everything we talked about with anovulation causing heavy periods, endometrial dysfunction, which is a diagnosis of exclusion, iatrogenic, for example, causing anovulatory cycles or giving someone warfarin or whatever and it causing a heavy period. And then the N is not otherwise specified to basically tell you that, you know, there's more than nine causes of this medical condition. Treatments, so any contraception that contains progesterone will help. And the one that you can use locally is a marina, so that's a progesterone intrauterine device. Estrogen thickens the endometrium. Progesterone maintains the endometrium. If you constantly expose the endometrium to progesterone, that will prevent it from thickening. It'll basically block the effects of estrogen. It'll just maintain the endometrium in whatever state it's in. Endometrial radioablation is a day procedure where you insert a device and use radio frequencies to ablate the endometrium, which essentially burns it, and that will prevent bleeding. Hysterectomy can be used, but there's certain guidelines to sort of, you know, there's a stepwise approach before we just go doing hysterectomies. Hysterectomies can have, you know, broad psychological impacts. Um, yeah, that's, that's a whole area of its own. Um, and if there's an underlying cause, treat it. You know, if it's hypothyroidism leaving, leading to anovulatory cycles, treat the hypothyroidism. Tranexamic acid can be helpful. That's a uh, drug that will uh, maintain clots, basically. So that'll help reduce ble uh, bleeding. Postmenopausal bleeding. Any postmenopausal bleeding should be investigated for endometrial cancer. Um, so in terms of investigation, on a transvaginal ultrasound, um, if the endometrial thickness is, it should be less than uh, five millimeters, that's the upper limit of normal. So anything five, meter, five millimeters or greater is suspicious in postmenopausal women. You can do a papel biopsy or a dilatation hysteroscopy and curatage um, to actually get a sample and visualize the endometrial lining. Uh, and do, you know, pathology on that. Neither investigation is perfect, and, you know, you should consider other causes of bleeding from the genitourinary tract. So um, in someone who you could be worried about kidney cancer, um, consider your urinal urinalysis and ultrasound KUB for the workup of renal or bladder cancer as a cause of the bleeding. All women on tamoxifen, because it's a positive modulator on uh, estrogen on the endometrium, uh, they have an increased risk of endometrial uh, hyperplasia and endometrial cancer. So it should be investigated regardless um, of whether or not there's bleeding even. You know, if it's in incidentally found, um, they should just be worked up regardless. In terms of pregnancy screening, you should have a look at this um, pregnancy health record document. Uh, it's got everything in there that the midwives do, and uh, it, it sort of summarizes everything in terms of weeks and the visits, but this is just kind of an overview of some of the important things. So at the first visit, you need to confirm the pregnancy. Do a urine dipstick and midstream urine to look for bacteria. Um, people who are pregnant can have asymptomatic bacteria, and it needs to be treated because um, urinary tract infection can cause premature labor and other issues. And you need to do some blood tests. So check their blood type and screen for any antibodies that they have. So um, not only the whole anti-D thing, but there's other special antibodies like um, anti-M, anti-K, and anti-Duffy. Um, the, there's this whole sort of inappropriate way of remembering those that um, the anti-Duffy antibody, um, they die. The anti-Kelly uh, antibody, it kills. And the anti-M antibody, it maims.
anyway. So they need to be screened for and appropriately risk assessed in terms of neonatal intensive care unit after birth. Full blood count to check for low hemoglobin, uh, which there's a whole debate around, you know, what, you know, should you just give iron transfusions to people? Do they need to be symptomatically anemic? And there's plenty of debate around that. And so much government money gets spent on iron transfusions in hospital that shouldn't, um, shouldn't do. Glucose uh, is good just to check in the blood. There's also like a formal oral glucose tolerance test later on. Syphilis, rubella, hepatitis B and C, HIV. Um, they're the main infections. You'll also see all sorts of other stuff like CMV, varicella, herpes, but these are the ones actually evidence-based recommended to test for. Syphilis, rubella, hep B, C, and HIV. Then you've got 10-week um, bloods, which go along with the um, sort of the early nuchal translucency scan. So they include beta HCG and what's called PAP A. This has replaced the old screening, which had um, estrogen, alpha feta protein, and beta HCG or something like that. This new test with beta HCG, PAP A, and the nuchal translucency is much more accurate. But the PBL case LOs weren't updated last year when I did this, and um, the head of Obskine laughed because she said, oh, we've been doing Pape for like a decade now, so that's bad that that hasn't been updated. Um, the 11 to 13 weeks visit includes the nuchal translucency scan, which is the first ultrasound. The evidence base is to have two ultrasounds in pregnancy. Um, the first one is for nuchal translucency, and you can do NIPT, which is non-invasive um, testing. Uh, that's not everyone will get that though. That's an kind of optional thing that can sort of more accurately screen for certain issues. And then for certain groups, chorionic villus sampling is offered or amniocentesis is offered. For multi-choice questions to remember which one you can do first, just mentally think that, you know, very, very early on in implantation, chorionic villi form. So they're there first. Amniocentesis is sampling of amniotic fluid from the amniotic sac. You need a big amniotic sac to be able to do that. So that one must be later on in the pregnancy. The other sort of important landmark is around 20 weeks when we do the second ultrasound, the diagnostic morphology scan, where we look at um, the the uh, bone growth and facial features and the heart, uh, but the main thing that comes out of that scan is confirming the location of the placenta to make sure that it's not sitting over the cervix. If it sits over the cervix and then the baby tries to come out, it'll tear the placenta apart and uh, there'll be a massive hemorrhage. So we need to check that the placenta isn't over the cervix. Now we'll talk about those conditions a bit later. And you give your flu vaccine. Um, the yeah, so modern Down syndrome, you know, the other chromosomal things is beta HCG, PAP A, nuchal translucency, and the the lady's weight, height, and expected date of delivery. It all goes into an algorithm and gives you a risk assessment. Um, Around that sort of same time as the morphology scan, there's some follow-ups with another urine test. Um, and you want to consent the person for anti-rhesus D um, treatment if they, uh, if they need it. And we'll talk about that. After the morphology scan, you do a full assessment. And this is typically where a obstetrician might step in beyond a midwife. You do full blood count and an oral glucose tolerance test, typically around week 28. And for rhesus D negative women, you do a rhesus antibody screen. And at 28 weeks, if they are rhesus D negative and don't have antibodies, you give them their first dose of anti-D. 
at 28 weeks and you give them the uh, DTPA vaccine as well. The pertussis vaccine is most effective when it's given at this time. So um, a little bit more about the anti-RHD prophylaxis program. So for rhesus D negative women who do not already have antibodies against rhesus D, um, if, if they did have antibodies, then the anti-D has no purpose. The purpose of the anti-D is when fetal cells that are anti that are um, D positive, or you know, RHD positive, sorry, um, go from the fetal circulation into the maternal circulation. The mother who is um, RHD negative has an immune reaction to that blood and starts to produce anti D, uh, anti RHD antibodies. The anti D in Rogam is given to destroy that fetal blood because it, it kind of is the same antibody that the mum would make. It destroys that fetal blood before it gets a chance to be presented to the maternal immune system. So the mum never gets sensitized to the RHD positive blood of the first fetus. What would happen is that that first fetus would leak RHD positive blood into the maternal circulation. The mum would have an immune reaction. She would produce anti-RHD antibodies. She would hemolyze that blood, uh, but that baby would be okay. Then the next baby would cause a massive immune response because the mum's been sensitized by the first baby, and then you get hemolytic disease of the newborn. So to prevent that, we give this anti-D prophylaxis. Um, the first dose of anti-D is given at 28 weeks, and the second dose is given at 34 weeks. Um, I think the previous slide had an error and said 38 weeks. Um, it, it's, it's 34, definitely not 38. That would be too late. Um, and then you need additional doses whenever there's sensitizing events. So whenever mum has a um, bleed, um, or some kind of invasive procedure, she should get an additional RHD any time that there's a chance that fetal blood has leaked into the maternal circulation. In terms of the screening for gestational diabetes, um, so gestational diabetes is a condition that the mother will get where because the placenta releases factors that cause insulin resistance, she gets diabetes while she's pregnant. Um, early screening is available if you're high risk, um, but standard screening is a oral glucose tolerance test at 24 to 28 weeks. Um, and it's diagnosed if you meet any one of these three targets. So um, your fasting glucose was greater than 5.1, your one hour post um, oral glucose was greater than 10, or your two hours was greater than 8.5. Um, a lot of people will fall into this greater than 8.5 one because they've just got like a mild insulin resistance picture. Um, once the placenta is delivered, the insulin resistance goes away and so the diabetes goes away. But actually, um, because of multiple factors, their risk of getting type 2 diabetes, like the real diabetes, is much higher if they've had gestational diabetes. So it's really important to pick it up, manage it, and then provide lifestyle advice to try and reduce their risk of type 2 diabetes in the future as much as possible. Um, the treatment for gestational diabetes can be insulin or metformin. Um, and in terms of insulin, there's different recommendations depending on whether you had the high fasting, the high uh, postprandial, or if you had both. So if you had high fasting, that means that when you haven't had any food, your blood sugar is high. So therefore you need basal insulin that will cover you, you know, an intermediate acting quite a long time to reduce your fasting blood sugar. If it's only after meals, then you can use a short acting insulin after each meal. Um, we talked about those insulins during the type 2 diabetes uh, section of this lecture. If it's fasting and after meals, then you should use basal bolus. You take one long-acting insulin in the morning or at night or twice to um, uh, you know, cover you throughout the day, uh, 
and then after each meal you use a rapid acting just to reduce that little postprandial spike. Metformin is also an option, um, just to make sure that you're aware of that. In the past, people didn't like it because it does cross the placenta, whereas insulin doesn't cross the placenta. Uh, but they're pretty happy that metformin is safe during pregnancy these days. First line treatment for gestational diabetes is lifestyle modification. Uh, but if that doesn't work, you really need to get on top of it because gestational diabetes predisposes both the mother and the baby to multiple conditions. So for the mother, it increases her risk of preeclampsia, which we'll talk about later, her risk of type 2 diabetes in the future and gestational diabetes in future pregnancies, and her risk of requiring a C-section, which, you know, I'm not going to say C-sections are evil, but the general goal of women's health is to have a natural vaginal birth. That's, you know, what we're aiming for. So increased C-sections is kind of a bad thing. Uh, it increases the congenital cardiac brain um, issues and can lead to large for gestational age babies. And in terms of the neonate, um, they're more likely to have a premature birth with respiratory distress. And in women with gestational diabetes, the baby is chronically exposed to high levels of blood sugar and so the baby releases more insulin at rest than it normally would once it starts developing its own pancreas. And then when it's born, that hyperinsulinemia will persist for a while and the baby will get hypoglycemia. And I saw one of those babies in the pediatric uh, critical care unit. Um, it had like lines going into its umbilical cord to, um, you know, directly be in the uh, abdominal aorta and it had an infusion running of insulin with dextrose and just this tiny little baby that um, uh, yeah it was just having a really tough time with this persistent hypoglycemia. Uh, the long-term outcomes are it increases your risk of obesity, diabetes and metabolic syndrome when you are an adult. Hypertension in pregnancy, um, there is a couple of different definitions you should know. So uh, gestational hypertension is after 20 weeks of pregnancy. So once the placenta is doing stuff, you get high blood pressure. You didn't have high blood pressure in the past. And once you've had your baby, the blood pressure goes away. That's gestational hypertension. Um, it should be managed if, if it's high, you know, just like any blood pressure, uh, but it's not scary. Whereas preeclampsia is basically gestational hypertension plus a sign of organ failure, whether it's the kidney, brain, liver, um, so on. Um, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. So the management um, if the systolic is between 140 and 160 or diastolic is between 90 and 100 you should treat it and target less than 140 over 90 which is the same as just normal hypertension basically the first line therapies are starred um, they include methyl dopa and labetalol um, so you can't use ace inhibitors in pregnancy and then um, stuff like hydralazine, nifedipine, prazosin, and clonidine are second line. Methyl dopa has a delayed onset of activity. Um, you should look up its mechanism of action. It's, uh, these are drugs that you may not be familiar with. Um, but because it has a delayed onset of controlling blood pressure, as a resident, you might get called to the ward at night and they'll say, oh, this lady's blood pressure is still high. Can you chart another dose? And you know, you don't know any better and it's in the, you know, 90s and there was no easy available guideline. So you say sure and you chart it and the next day it's still high. So you chart another one and then 72 hours after the first dose, it all starts kicking in because it takes time and suddenly the blood pressure drops really, really low and you're yeah, pushing fluids and yeah, that's um, a story that the head told us that it really did happen. So it's important to familiarize yourself with these drugs and 
you know, when their actual onset would happen, so you don't go overdosing people because you're so used to amlodipine working instantaneously and so what. Um, the diagnosis of preeclampsia is when you have hypertension after 20 weeks uh, plus one or more signs of organ dysfunction. Useful investigations are full blood count, platelets, urea and electrolytes, liver function, LDH, coagulation, and to get a group and hold, uh, just to be ready in case you have to transfuse blood later on. Um, the management is to resuscitate them if, if they need it, um, control their blood pressure. If they're having seizures, give magnesium sulfate, or if you think they're about to have it, that stabilizes neurons to prevent seizures. And you should always check for magnesium toxicity. So it stabilizes neurons, but it also uh, can make your neuromuscular system be so chilled out that you get diminished reflexes. And then the next thing to become diminished is your breathing. So you should check that. Um, and you should plan to have the baby out as soon as possible. Uh, because the mother and baby can both die with preeclampsia if it becomes um, severe or if it becomes eclampsia. Um, this is just a little bit about the uh, pathogenesis of preeclampsia. So basically there's a issue in the placenta. It's not getting enough blood flow. It then releases factors into the circulation, which uh, kind of cause dysfunction in the endothelium. That systemic dysfunction in the endothelium results in blood clots forming everywhere. And then uh, that uses up your platelets, which causes the low platelets. And then red blood cells squish up against those blood clots and get hemolyzed, and that causes hemolysis. And the uh, altered blood flow into the liver causes liver dysfunction. The clots and vascular issues also reduce blood flow to the kidneys. So all of that put together gives you this potential for organ dysfunction. Um, so if the kidneys aren't working right, you'll get protein in the urine um, or you'll get creatinine quite high. And you'll note here that um, because of <clears throat> changes in pregnancy, the normal level of creatinine is lower than um, in a non-pregnant person because of fluid retention. So um, 90 is considered high here, whereas 90 would be very normal in a, norm, a non-pregnant person. Um, reduced urine output would be quite worrying. Low platelets, hemolysis, or signs of DIC would be very concerning. Uh, raised liver enzymes or severe pain in the liver would be concerning. And then neurological features would be very concerning. So, um, when you're examining someone who might have preeclampsia, you should uh, take a decent history and then have a look at them, test their reflexes, check for abdominal pain. Um, that's sort of like the main physical things. You could have a listen to their lungs and um, see how much urine they're producing. And then when they do urinate, do a little dipstick for protein and then send off bloods and see how you go. First trimester bleeding. So the best way to think about bleeding in pregnancy is to divide it into the early and the late. So this is the early bleeding. This is before you've got a placenta. So the scariest early tr first trimester bleeding bleed is ectopic pregnancy. Next is pregnancy loss, which can be a complete miscarriage which means it's been evacuated from the uterus, incomplete, which it's not evacuated, missed, which means you thought you were pregnant, you had a miscarriage, and then on ultrasound they've discovered that you're no longer pregnant, um, or a septic miscarriage, which is where you've miscarried, but in the process there's been retained tissue that's become infected and it's caused endometritis, and then that infection has progressed to the blood and you've become septic, and, and that's how people died um, throughout history. Um, the implantation of pregnancy causes a bleed. Um, threatened abortion is when uh, the, you know, it's 
it's a risk of having a miscarriage, but there hasn't actually been a miscarriage, and not all of them will progress to miscarriage. And then for anything, you need to consider that there's also the rest of the female reproductive tract. Um, there could also be the urinary tract bleeding too. So the cervix, vagina, or the uterus could all be bleeding. You know, you could have a uh, submucosal or pedunculated fibroid at the same time as being pregnant. It's not impossible. You could have cervical cancer while being pregnant. In this second and third trimester, you've now got a placenta. And so most of the causes of bleeding relate to having a placenta. Placenta previa is when the placenta is first. That's what previa means. And it's, it's that the placenta is low lying and sits on top of the cervix. As the, the uterus expands, as the baby's growing, that will stretch the placenta if it's in that lower portion of the uterus. And as it stretches, the vessels will be disrupted and you'll get bleeding. So placenta previa on its own can cause a painless bleeding as the uterus grows and that inferior of the seg uh, segment of the uterus extends. Placental abruption is when the placenta rips off of the uterus and in the process that's painful as it detaches. Uh, so that's another cause of bleeding. And then a rare cause is uterine rupture. So people that have had previous C-sections and things, their actual uterus can rupture and blood will go everywhere and it will really hurt. Then there's vasa previa, which is like placenta previa, but it's where the actual umbilical cord is sitting over the cervix. And similarly, that will stretch and bleed, but that can be rapidly fatal for the baby. Now, I was actually a vasa previa baby, and when they discovered this, my mum had to be admitted to hospital for the entire third trimester because if she had gone into labour, um, you know, a, a fetus has about as much blood as a can of coke. So in less than a minute, if that umbilical cord ruptures and you bleed through the umbilical vessels, um, as a fetus, you can die in less than a minute or so, um, and then the mother will bleed as well. So you need to be in hospital all that time so that, you know, the moment there's any signs of labor, they can do a C-section immediately. Everything was okay. Uh, so it's pretty cool that obstetrics and gynecology is the reason that I exist. Um, and again, cervical, vaginal, or uterine pathologies can cause bleeding at any time. Let's talk a little bit about the normal labor and delivery. So the normal labor and delivery has three stages, and then there's a fourth stage that is kind of a resolution stage. Stage one is cervical dilatation. It begins with a latent phase where contractions are beginning and the cervix slowly softens, ripens, thins out, and begins to dilate. Uh, at about, you know, less than a centimeter per hour, and it goes from zero to six centimeters. So that can, if it's your first pregnancy, um, that could be like a good 10 hours of just contractions and slow, slow dilatation. If you've, you know, had multiple pregnancies before, it could be like four hours and suddenly you've got a baby from the moment you had your contraction. It, it varies a lot. Um, the active phase is then more rapid and it's from six centimeters to 10 centimeters at a rate of, you know, anywhere from one to four centimeters per hour. So it could be anywhere from one to four hours. The way that you tell this is you do a vaginal examination and with your fingers, you kind of scissor them out and somehow mentally, because you're a magical midwife, you can accurately say, oh, yep, yeah, this is seven centimeters and we're fully effaced. And you're just like, bro, how are you possibly measuring that without looking at anything? And it's just, you know, it's, it's an art, not a science. Um, but once it gets to 10 centimeters fully effaced, um, and effacement refers to the thickness of the cervix, it, it's then ready to begin stage two. So stage one is going from zero centimeters to 10 centimeters dilated. 
the internal cervical loss is what you're measuring, um, where the latent phase was 0 to 6 and the active phase was 6 to 10, and the active phase is much more rapid, and it's associated with heavier, more regular contractions. Stage 2 is when the actual baby comes out, so it's from 10 centimeters cervical dilation to the delivery of the baby. And then the baby is attached to an umbilical cord, which is attached to a placenta, and the placenta stays inside the mother. You can leave the baby um, attached to the placenta for a while, that's called delayed cord clamping, and then you can clamp the cord and cut it. Um, and that's typically favoured because there's quite a lot of blood still in that placenta that the baby might want. Um, and then once the cord is cut, you wait another half an hour and the placenta will eventually be delivered. Um, if that is taking too long or if the mother just elects for it, she can have active management of phase three where they give some oxytocin and that induces uterine contraction um, and that helps to push the placenta out. I will admit I haven't delivered a baby, um, but I have delivered a placenta. So that's basically half a baby, and it was warm and weird, uh, but obviously beautiful and all of that stuff. Uh, if the tissue of the placenta is retained in the uterus, that means that there's now a connection maintained between the world and the maternal circulation, and so she can bleed through that tissue. Um, and that's one of the T's of postpartum hemorrhage management. Uh, so you want to make sure all of that placenta gets out in time so that the uterus can clamp down because all of the blood vessels in the uterus, uh, they're at risk of bleeding. And when the uterus, you know, squeezes down, it compresses those vessels. And that's another way that you prevent bleeding after um, delivering baby. So leaving tissue in the uterus is very, very bad. Then there's the fourth stage after the placenta is delivered, where the uterus involutes and slowly recovers, and that's for two hours. And in that time, there's a high risk of postpartum hemorrhage, so you need to just monitor the mother and just be ready um, if there's a large amount of bleeding that's not stopping, that she may need some, you know, basically like a, a met call or a code blue. Let's talk a little bit about rupture of membranes, because you're going to hear this word and you're going to think, what the hell is a membrane? It's the amniotic sac. Um, why would you call it a membrane and not the amniotic sac? I don't know. Membrane sounds very alien to me, but who knows? So when the amniotic sac ruptures, it's typically at the beginning of labor, and you call that spontaneous rupture of membranes, SHROM you can have premature rupture of membranes, and that's when they rupture before labor, PROM. Um, if PROM is extended for a certain number of hours, that's a high risk of sepsis for the mother and the baby. Some things that can cause SROM are urinary tract infection, uh, a gynecological tract infection, like a sexually transmitted infection that's been missed, or it's a new infection, um, or smoking. Smoking is a very high risk factor for PROM. Uh, similarly, for pre-PROM, which is when you've, it's, it's much worse because it's it's PROM, but also it's pre-term, so it's you're not even at 37 weeks. Um, that's, that's a high risk of sepsis for the baby and, and also still risky for the mother. And then just to be aware of it, AROM is artificial rupture of membranes which there's multiple techniques. Um, there's like a membrane sweep, and then there's devices and whatever, um, amniotomy, and they're all things that midwives can use to induce labor if uh, you know things aren't coming along the way they should. Uh, you know, having a premature baby is, is bad, but having a post-term baby is bad because that baby's gonna poop, and if that poop is in the amniotic sac, they will, get uh, meconium respiration um, or aspiration, um, and that's that can be fatal. So we don't want the baby to be in there for too short, but we definitely don't want it to be in there for too long, you know, 
greater than 42 weeks would be very unfavorable. Talking about labor, premature labor. Um, so in Australia, that's defined as less than 37 weeks. In America, it's less than 38, but just remember less than 37. Every time you write down premature labor next year, just put 37 in the title and you'll remember it eventually. Uh, if it's happening and you're not at a tertiary hospital with a NICU, while the baby's still inside the mother, get the ambulance ready and let's send them to a hospital with a NICU. That's the greatest predictor of baby survival. You want to give antenatal corticosteroids if they're less than 35 weeks. You want two doses of betamethasone that are 24 hours apart to promote surfactant production in the lungs to prevent an infant respiratory distress syndrome on birth. And you can do tocolysis, which uh, basically delays labor. You can use a calcium channel blocker like nifedipine. Um, and basically you're just aiming to delay labor long enough to allow the 24 hours to give the two doses of antenatal corticosteroids and do your transfer to a tertiary hospital. Unfortunately, you can't just give nifedipine every day until the baby's at term. It just doesn't work. It, the best you get is like one to two days of delayed labor at most. Um, antibiotics can be given if, if uh, she's in established preterm labor. Um, you can give your GBS prophylaxis. Um, there's various, various protocols for all of this when you do pediatrics. Um, and magnesium sulfate is recommended if the baby's less than 30 weeks because it's neuroprotective and will help to prevent cerebral palsy um, and other things from occurring. Postpartum hemorrhage is when the baby's been born and the mother bleeds. Um, half a litre after vaginal birth or more than a litre after C-section. Um, and, you know, healthy women if they may be asymptomatic because their blood volume is so large from being pregnant, right? Because you retain fluid when you're pregnant. Um, the four T's are tone, trauma, tissue, and thrombin. Tone is the most common cause of bleeding and it's when the uterus is atonic. And so you can treat that by massaging it to make it contract or you can give oxytocin to make it contract. Syndometrin is another option. It's an ergotamine um, derivative. Trauma, cuts to the cervix, vagina, or perineum, um, or uterine rupture or inversion, all bleed. Tissue, the retained placenta, membranes, or clots, which are preventing uterine contraction and allowing blood flow. And then thrombin, if you've got coagulation issues, disseminated intravascular coagulation in the context of preeclampsia before birth, for example, um, or, you know, all sorts of things. Um, so we won't go too much into treatment, but basically you can um, treat them based on those four T's and there's some surgical management if you need it. Let's talk about a scary case that um, is, is good to have mentally. So a 27 year old para three, so three times pregnant, presented to the GP with heavy menstrual bleeding. So the things we talked about in heavy menstrual bleeding were anovulatory cycles, so that would be on my, your mind. Maybe she's got polycystic ovaries, who knows? She has no other complaints and no abdominal pain. She's on the OCP though, so it's probably not related to anovulatory cycles because she's not ovulating, she's on the pill. She has no significant medical history or surgical history, no STIs, and a normal examination in terms of vitals but there's some suprapubic tenderness, and on vaginal examination, there was no vaginal cause of bleeding, but the posterior fornix of the vagina was a bit tender. If you didn't do that vaginal examination, this, you know, you wouldn't really think too much of this case. You would just say, oh, maybe we'll need to try a different kind of pill. Let's try a uh, you know intrauterine marina or something right because she's young and healthy and then they decided to do a urine pregnancy test which was positive the transvaginal ultrasound showed no intrauterine pregnancy 
and there was free fluid in the pouch of Douglas. She was immediately transferred to hospital, where on laparoscopy they found hemoperitoneum leaking from a left tubal ectopic pregnancy. She had an ectopic pregnancy. She could have died. She could have died. She was actively dying from blood. <laughs> and she went to her GP with heavy menstrual bleeding, and she was otherwise fine. And she's on the pill. She's on the pill. Um, so I just bring this up because ectopic pregnancy is always like a weird exam question thing because it's like to be a safe intern you have to know that ectopic pregnancy is a thing because it kills people even though it's rare um yeah so i found this case and i thought oh my goodness how many of you guys would miss this based on the presenting complaint of heavy periods in someone on the pill um, without any pain, nausea, or vomiting, or just any complaints, right? Uh, and someone who's already been pregnant quite a few times and hasn't had STIs. So what is ectopic pregnancy? When someone has early pregnancy bleeding with abdominal pain, um, or and, and they might have had amenorrhea, suggesting that they aren't pregnant, plus or minus shoulder tip pain, which as we talked about, if, if the diaphragm gets irritated by blood, that can cause shoulder tip pain. Um, they might have an adnexal mass on examination, which is basically just when you do a vaginal examination and go either side of the cervix, you push a little bit and that whole area that you're feeling is the adnexa with you know, the ovary and the ligament holding the ovary and the fallopian tube. Um, tachycardia. What do you do when there is a female in the emergency room? You confirm the pregnancy with beta-HCG and you confirm the location of the pregnancy via ultrasound. Is it in the uterus or is it not in the uterus? If the HCG is above a certain amount and there's nothing in the uterus, the pregnancy is probably somewhere else and it's an ectopic. If the HCG is staying steady and it's not growing at the rate you would expect for a normal placenta, it's also likely to be an ectopic. How do you manage ectopic? If they're stable, you can just do nothing. Um, if it's very small, that's quite risky though. Medically, you can give methotrexate, which will prevent cell division um, in that growing embryo. Uh, and then surgically, you could laparoscopically uh, you can do a salpingostomy where you basically suck out the ectopic or you can do a salpingectomy where you remove that fallopian tube. So the moral of the story here is any woman of reproductive age, you should do a pregnancy test. Um, but please get her informed consent first because it's going to be awkward if you have to come back and tell her she's pregnant and she didn't even know that you were doing that test or why you were doing it. Let's talk quickly about ovarian torsion. It's uh, when the ovary twists around its own ligament and compresses its own blood supply. Um, however, you should note that the ovary has a dual arterial blood supply, so the arterial supply may not actually be visibly absent on ultrasound. The first ultrasound sign will be venous congestion. So with testicular ultra, uh, torsion on ultrasound you'll see no arterial flow and that confirms the diagnosis um, but technically you shouldn't be doing ultrasounds for testicular torsion if you genuinely suspect it you should just be sending them into surgery to have it explored and detoursed waste no time uh, but for the ovary if you do the ultrasound and there's still arterial flow that doesn't mean that the ovary is safe because there's that dual arterial supply. If there's venous congestion and there's a cyst on the ovary making it heavy and likely to spin, that's very, very concerning for ovarian torsion. Um, it's more likely with ovarian cysts and tumors. Uh, it's sudden onset unilateral lower abdominal pain, especially post-coital because things are moving. Um, so post-coital abdominal pain is really concerning from an obscine point of view, especially if you have ovarian cysts known. Um, you need to rule out pregnancy, do an ultrasound, 
uh, pelvic and um, transvaginally. And if you really, really think this is going on, you need to do an emergency laparoscopy and detorse the cyst and uh, detorse the ovary and drain any cysts that are present to prevent it from happening again. This is just an AMBOSS table of various differentials for abdominal pain in pregnant people. Um, you should know all of these by the end of P4P, P, to be honest. Like, you don't have to know them perfectly, but you should be aware of these things. Let's talk in detail about cervical screening because it can be an OSCE station and it's um, relevant for P4P for P exam uh, from a DHC and a DKHI point of view. What happens? Well, one, you collect the sample. Two, they do the HPV test with partial genotyping. The three possibilities are A, HPV wasn't detected, she should return for screening in five years. C, I'm skipping B for now, HPV 16 or 18 were detected, which are the oncogenic strains. They do a reflex um, cytology, liquid-based cytology, and then refer for colposcopy. And then option B is this middle ground where there is HPV, but it's not 16 or 18, so they do the reflex liquid-based cytology. If that liquid-based cytology shows high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, which is equivalent to CIN2 or 3 on the old pap smear system, you get referred for colposcopy. If you had no lesion or a low-grade lesion, you repeat the test in a year. Then in a year, if there's HPV not detected, you go back to the five-year screening. If any type of HPV is detected and uh, it's still there because now it's been persistent for a year, because remember you did one screen and then you waited 12 months to do this one, that means you've got a persistent HPV infection that's hanging around a little too long. They also might get referred for colposcopy. There may be variation there, but, but that's, that's what the guideline says. So this is just a table um, from the government summarizing that. So not detected five years, 1618, colposcopy, not 16, but still HPV, do the um, cytology, it's either negative or low grade or it's high grade, you end up testing in a year, HPV no, five years, HPV yes, get colposcopy, or if it's just high grade in the first place, get colposcopy. What is colposcopy? It's a microscopic view of the ectocervix and it allows interventions done in an outpatient clinic. A speculum device attached to a microscope is inserted into the vagina and the epithelial layer of the cervix is translucent. And the, so the cervix appears pink with the sub-epithelial layer um, being the pink part. So we look at that cervix under a microscopic view and it's all pink. We then apply an acetic acid dye. And because uh, cells that are sort of cancerous or precancerous, um, or these are all precancerous actually because they haven't invaded the basement membrane, these uh, neoplastic cells, we'll call them, um, they are very condensed because they have a high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. And that means when you add the acetic acid, they maintain their density, whereas the normal cells, uh, they're less dense, okay? Uh, and, and because of that density, as they shrivel up with the acetic acid sucking water out of them, they will turn white because it's like an opaque, dense thing sitting on top of what used to be pink, and so it appears white. That's called acetowhiting. The next thing is adding iodide dye, 
which normal epithelium has lots of glycogen, but because of abnormal glucose metabolism, the cancer cells have very little glycogen. And sorry, it's not cancer. Uh, the CIN cells, they're not cancer unless they've invaded the basement membrane. I'm sorry. They have very little glycogen and gl iodide gl binds to glycogen. So healthy cells with lots of glycogen will turn brown. If you combine these two, then you paint the cervix so that the normal cervix is brown and any areas of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia are white. And then you can cut those out. So you can uh, document it. And then depending on where they are, you can do a let's, which is like a wire loop that's hot and can scoop stuff out. Or you can do a cone biopsy with, with a little metal sort of cone thing that can cut stuff out if it's extending into the endocervix. Ultimately, prevention is key. Promote HPV vaccination. Um, it's important for boys and girls. It can cause head and neck cancer and the vaccine can also prevent that. Cervical cancer very quickly. So the risk factors are HPV infection, especially with 16 and 18 smoking and immunosuppression. Smoking because it causes immunosuppression and immunosuppression because it allows HPV infection to be more aggressive. Staging is essentially stage one, it's limited to the cervix. And then stage three, it's gone beyond the cervix and it may involve lymph nodes. And stage four, it's gone into the bladder or the rectum. Um, the difference between stage one and two is basically just size. So it's kind of similar to all other cancers that one and two are quite similar. It's just size. Stage three involves lymph nodes or deeper structures. And stage four is metastasis, basically, to different organs. Well done. You made it through that whole lecture. Um, uh, that women's health section isn't totally yield for your exam, but it'll be very helpful for third year. So, so good luck, enjoy your holidays, and thank you for a wonderful year. I'm glad that you let me waffle on to you uh, as much as I liked with these ridiculously long review lectures. Um, I hope they've been a tiny bit helpful. Thank you.